When I was young, I felt unwanted and felt this need to excel, to be accepted by parents and my peers, right? As I've mm -hmm. grown to love myself, I noticed the extreme lengths black men go to show that they are somebody. Have you experienced this in your personal life? Mm. The desire to be somebody. I definitely you know, have experienced that. I think there's something in all of us, particularly young men, but humans in general, but particularly young boys, that you want to you wanna, you wanna impress your father. You know, you want to impress the people around. Typically, you develop this relationship when you're younger. If I do good, I get good grades. I get validation. I get good job. They're happy with me. They're pleased with me. And so from as early as you can understand, you're developing this understanding. A plus B equals this. I think in general, whether you're coming from a context where you have, you know, a father, a mother, and a father who's affirming you, you still have that desire. But in particular, if you don't have that present you know father figure or you know mother affirming you in a healthy way you now are going out into the world hungry not full from that and so you now have this desire and validation and that's even beyond just that i think there's something in how i think men are made and how we're designed to want to perform or understanding that there's some level of sacrificial nature to i i kill i kill what i eat right and so you have all of those playing together and so you're essentially going out into the world saying I'm somebody. And I think the truth is in, in how we're made, whether if you're a faith, I think that we're all designed to be somebody. We are somebody, right? But sometimes we go about validating we're somebody and not necessarily the healthiest ways. And uh, how did you overcome that struggle? Yeah, I mean, I think for a long time and I think up to this point, I mean, I think that was partly my, you know, my journey even to faith was that in many ways, I would be looking to make sure because I saw my father, my parents, if you come from immigrant background or you don't come from immigrant background, we have sacrificial parents. You're like, they've done so much for me. I want to pay it back. And that's a debt you can never really fully pay back, even if you do everything. And so for such a long time, I would be really pushing to say, like, God, I, you know, father, I want to I want to make sure that I, I honor my dad, honor my mom and do that. And even when times when I'm like, I'm thinking I'm disappointing them. <laughs> They're not even, they're like, what are you talking about? We're proud of you. I think I started to get over when I realized that that's a treadmill you'll never get off of. And at some point it wasn't healthy when you feel like I'm just never making any ground, whether it was my earthly father or my heavenly father. And I think that's where I came to even the idea around faith, where I said, you know what, man, like that was an idea where it's just like, I will never do enough. <laughs> and so I got to actually have some security that no matter what I do, even though I'm going to give my best, I'm still solid, I'm still secure. And I think I was fortunate to have a dad who was kind of like, I'm beyond proud of you. It doesn't matter what, I'm proud. And so I think getting over that was more of faith. I don't know if anybody really gets over it on this side of glory, man. I'm not fully over it. But I think I have a help, more healthier relationship with the, my work and my performance and what I do and my standing that I don't feel like, man, I'm completely nothing if I'm not doing enough or if I'm not performing enough or making good on all the goals I have. And, uh no, that's and we're both fortunate. At least we had parents to give us some form of validation. Yeah, I notice people go to on. Um, they end up doing unhealthy things and things that are detrimental to them and then in the community yeah. to get that validation. Right. I want to ask you also as a man who was a high performing athlete, mm -hmm. uh, speaking to athletes after they distance themselves from their experience. I notice a lot of people didn't love the sport. They did the sport for validation. Did you see that at all? Oh, yeah, man. It was an outlet. I mean, I think even brothers right now, no matter what age you are, sometimes you, 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 the gym is part release, <laughs> stress release, but also there's something to be like, you know, you were, there was identity formation, right? You became somebody, you, were, you belonged to something. So whether you were track and field, it was more singular, or you're basketball, I think as you balled, you know, or I played soccer, football, you know, to many, right? You were also, you belong, so you already had identity built in. Right. You know, where I'm this, I'm the midfielder or I'm the one guard, I'm a two guard, I'm whatever. And I think there's something about just that, that not just the rush, but the fact that I'm needed, I'm valuable. And it seemed like there was a direct relationship between what I put in and actually the outcome of how I got that validation. So you felt like you had more control over it. Right. So it's so like if I just put in the work. I work hard. I do what I need to do. I'm faster. Right. You know, shoot, if I put up the, I put up the shots, I'm better. And I think that's both partly addictive. <laughs> right. But I think there's something to be said around. I think it's it's a powerful, powerful mechanism of like realizing your value, your belonging to something much larger. But also it's like identity, because especially if you excel 
there becomes an identity tied to it. You are the track star, you are the this. And actually that was something that, you know, tripped me up when I got to college because I came after I finished high school, I had this dynamic where I wanted to go represent Nigerian Olympics. That was my goal. I didn't take any time off. I ended up getting injured. And there's one thing to go for years where you the man. <laughs> <laughs> everybody know, man. I mean, whether you the you the you the man that pick up on twenty one, you know what I'm saying? Everybody know you, man. He got the J on the outside, you know, <laughs> like or you the versus people even questioning your your vision and your dreams, or nobody's really talking about you. And you know, that's I think for many people, you hear so many athletes. One of my former athletes, former you know um, Olympic uh, silver medalist, talks about this. My boy Trey Hardy at Texas, you know, where after you leave, who am I? I'm glad you brought that point because that's the one of the hardest things for people, not even athletes, people who are high performers. Mm. Uh, your whole identity is placed in that industry or that identity. And, and I think that's why a lot of people do stuff longer than they should, especially business people. Oof. Because I know people probably should have retired like 20 years ago, bro. And they half did and they're still doing it because as I've gotten older, I understand like, what else do they have outside of that? And they haven't built any relationships outside of that. Ooh. You know, so it's, yeah. it's kind of that vibe, you know? Yeah, that, that, that's really good. I mean, you, you often see this, you see this in every industry. You see this in business, right? We've seen where somebody stayed too long. We see this in ministry, right? Where you, there's a generation now who can't necessarily, even economically, can't retire economically. But even if economically things were set, hypothetically, the transition of who am I? outside of this pulpit? Who am I outside of this role? Who am I? There's a couple that, I, uh, that I've been serving it's like a year and a half, much older, mid sixties couple and well, high earner, high earner, you know, brother. And she's concerned cause you're just like, you know, he's getting older. He's still going, you know, pretty hard. And, you know, he's just like, you know, that's what I'm known for. I'm good. And it's almost this fear of like, man, I, I don't know who I am after that. Will I, number one, will you value me the same way? Can I earn the same way? And I just don't even like that dynamic. On top of that, which you, you pointed on as well, the dynamic of relationship, especially for brothers. Often we build, we're a lot utilitarian, I would say, I said it generally. But it's a lot more utilitarian what this has got to do, more pragmatic. And a lot of times the relationships are either my significant other, if you're fortunate, and then work. And then when work is gone, you call our sisters, man, shout out to our sisters. Our sisters do a really good job. I think it's part of how they were designed in their divine embodiment that they're really relational. You know, brothers and oftentimes relate by competition, right? Versus just communally communal. And so often when that's gone, now the brother's looking around. So you both leave, lose relationships that are core. You belong to something, now those are gone. And then on top of that, you're like, who am I? And then at the end of the way, the world is looking at you like, we only value you based on what you can provide. And so you have this two tier dynamic of like, it's hard for me to transition because it's like, I don't know who I am on the other side of that. I don't know if I could kind of recreate a new identity or I'm holding on to this. It's kind of like when people talk about relationships and they like, you know, people often are straddling and they're like, you can't receive the new one until you let go of that old one because you're afraid if I let go of the old one, I don't get the new one, then I lost that too. Similarly, I think when it comes to relation, uh, it comes to career and what you do, human doing versus human being, that same dynamic. It's like, if I let go of old girl, <laughs> and nobody knew that's better comes by, I'm afraid I'm, I'm gonna be by myself. There's a by myself view about career that I think brothers and sisters have, but particularly brothers where it's like, if I let go, who am I? Yeah. There's another part. I just wanna jump back on the part where you spoke about um, being somebody, right? Hmm. What I noticed with the young brothers, I taught for a while in high school and uh, at a high school. And I noticed that the young brothers that, one, I didn't know how privileged I was growing up in regards to uh, my position in society mm. as an athlete we get a distorted view because you may be all state but you want to be all american right versus the man that no one ever says hi or girls don't talk to him and i really that's the majority of boys so like a lot of times we have these conversations they're like what you would refer to as a high performing person but the experience of the average boy in america is like pretty lonely mm. and they never have any like the simplest thing for someone to say hi to you and look you in your eyes, or ask you how your day is doing, or you have a lot of boys that never heard good job, bro. Man, that's, that is such a good point. You know, I, I think, you know, what's very, what's interesting, right? You know, you ever, you know, you think about when, you know, you see when your parents get older, one of the things that's like really 
shocking even as you get older is that you realize your parents were children. <laughs> like the older they get, you realize how sometimes they at times could be somewhat childish and you realize that they're imperfect and not superhuman. It's almost like the veil broke, like Santa Claus ain't real. Similarly, you'll also get older in life and you'll hear about people who, they still hold on to things that happened in high school. They're holding on to things, not just family's things, but like, I remember what you did to me or they're going to reunion, like I'm gonna show that person. And you're like, wow, that stuff is really formative. But now when you take the context of like, being somebody, being known versus even at that formative time, that really, you know, like, like that really like firms up in this person's brain. And I think there's some statistics that talks about even like, what well, half of brothers will never marry, right? I think more than even a third will never have, will never have sex in their life, will never reproduce, right? And so this idea is almost like the bubble. If you're doing well socioeconomically, you think that your world is the world. And then you recognize like, yo, I'm privileged, right? <laughs> yo, man, like this is not normal. Right? My parents being here is not normal. My parents being alive is not normal. Me being able to not be necessarily paid check to check is not normal. Similarly, this idea to say you're seen, you're valued. I remember there was a conversation a couple of years ago. It was like at the, before the pandemic really hit. And I was talking about loneliness. And that's been my work for, for a while. And one, uh, a sister, I remember, I put the post, she was like, Lawrence, you make this seem so sad. Like everybody, people out here lonely. Who's lonely like this? And I said, man, you are an Ivy League educated, multi-degree, commercially attractive young woman who is married with children. You, I, I, have you considered that you may not be the normal experience or the common experience of most of the people in society? And I think to your point, when it comes to brothers coming up where they were not seen, they were not valued in that way, you realize like that's the norm. Now you see now the sleeping giant of our time where they're growing up, they still have human desires. They still want to be known. They still, everybody does. You know, when people talk about love, I always d d distinguish, right? People say like, everybody deserves love. I'm like, yeah, not necessarily romantic love, <laughs> right? But we're all made to be loved. They, that doesn't change whether or not you were privileged or not. So you have that. And so the challenge becomes, if I don't have that privilege of the parents, the, fe the friendships, the, 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 the upper mobility professionally, the standing as it relates to my social circles, my sports or otherwise, that hunger's still there. I have to fulfill it somehow. And so somehow that could be addiction. Somehow that could be isolation. And I get it through unhealthy Relationship. The womanizing, the whoring. I think that's why it's so big with men, you know? Brother, man, because I, I am somebody, right? And I, you know, everybody, everybody wants the sense to be the man on their block. You see that dynamic, whether it's the block, whether it's your neighborhood, this is a universal human condition. I am somebody because you are somebody, but you're, you're somebody in another regard. And I think be it, if you have an unhealthy relationship, we see that every single day, every single day, brothers and sisters are crying out. I'm somebody, do you see me? And so always here at the block, I remember growing up, Brooklyn, K and F, Flatbush, you know, like, you know, you would even summers, like I love the summers in the, in the city or Brooklyn or Harlem, cats rolling out about with the music playing. I was just like, you hear the music, why is it so loud? See me, see me, look at this, see, look at this. You know, when you hear brothers say like, oh, now I got this car for me. Some part of it is the sport of it, but some part of it is just like, you want the sisters, you want people to see, oh, you got that car, you rolled through the block with that new range want people to see it similar oh no i got this hair for me i got the body thing for me no you can't even see yourself you got it because of the attention there's some part of it you and you you enjoy that you see but some part of it is because you it's the attention and the validation you get from it, it it's nothing new nothing new under the sun man i once heard you say isolation is killing us right mm -hmm. uh please speak about the correlation between the death of neighborhoods and the rise of depression and suicide in the black community. Mm. This is saying like, you know, babies die for lack of touch. And if a baby dies for lack of touch, then you know how much more, you know, God's children as they get older, that we were made for relationship. That's in all of us, right? And so whether you take it from a faith perspective that even God in and of himself was in relationship with himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, there's something about all of us. Right. The isolation and loneliness, you know, we're the more digi most digitally connected generation, yet the most isolated and depressed. And so you have this dynamic. And so I could I'll give macro and then I'll kind of go micro. The macro dynamic is that, you know, as we as communities, you know, I, I saw something on the, um, the note talking about compound communities. Right. Good models of that. People heard of Detroit. 
or even the many of the villages where we came up from, where you had multiple generations in one area, right? New Orleans, one of my favorite cities. I remember doing my summer programs at Xavier and there's Painter Street. There's one street in New Orleans and one of my friends, her whole family lived on the same street. Painter Street, I still remember that. There was a way that we lived. Some of it was because we had jobs there, we had everything there, and there was a value in cult, uh, value for community. We all recognized what happened systematically, particularly in the black community in the West, whether it was just separating the, 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 the brother from the home, right? And then also economic mobility. So, okay, there's not enough jobs, or Ford doesn't have enough jobs here in Detroit. I have to go where there, I can actually support. So whether that man left, or the families left, or I'm getting ed I'm educated now with our generation. I'm going to school in another place. I may not get a job in the same place, right? Or I'm first. I'm the first person of. I need to establish something for myself. So there's this very individualistic, not as communal dynamic where you have now people living separately in all these places. And plus, it wasn't necessarily the norm that people were doing compound communities anymore. So you have that just at a macro level. People are more transient. We're moving, but then you have this dynamic of like, man our relationship to this thing, right? You know, so I always say like, you know, Facebook was started on my campus, I was class of 2006, you know, and you know, we were seeing literally, you know, our most important relationship building years. That's your core. We forget that one of your core relationship building years are those high school and college years because you could develop relationships passively. Meaning, everybody knows now, you adult, man, that just work. <laughs> like, ah, you know, like, uh, two, uh, Saturday, I got to go get up, shower, go over there, gas in the car. You know, you knew the dining hall was there, the such and such. So even if I wasn't even trying, there's a repeated, because it's trust barriers, the first thing. Am I familiar with you? Are you safe at a core? And then relate affinity, time, shared experience. And then that's how you build relationships. So you had that environment. But now you take that, and now the manner in which you develop relationships is now being item atomized, right? So I would come and have lunch, dinner, pick up the phone and call, versus like, <laughs> this, transience. Everybody's going to a different place. So you have this, my, my, my 20s and 30s, I'm now disconnected in the ways that generations weren't before. And so now they call it like a fire shows or builder's work. So now when you get to the 30s and 40s and where parents are getting sick now, things are happening, you look around, you're like, wait, I'm in a city, I came here for a job, not necessarily tied to relationships or my family being here. Life is happening, right? But then here's the other piece. Later in life, not necessarily in a building family. For many of you coming from economic lack, whether you're a brother or a sister, and especially I think it disproportionately affects our sisters a lot, where it's saying, focus on your career. <laughs> I, I want to jump in. I got to give a shout out to my brother. Yeah. I'm not saying he's brilliant because my brother, he's my brother. He's a professor at Princeton, right? Mm. Dr. J. Paul Hines. And we were reasoning and he was speaking about how detrimental it was for black people to get access to mainstream society and economic mobility. I grew up with my parents and my grandmother was downstairs and even the neighbors, it was just a community vibe, bro, right? Yeah, it was the hood, this and that, but it was still a community and people looked out for each other mm -hmm. and I had help. I am down here with my wife and my daughter and that's it. <laughs> it's not it's not natural. You get what I'm saying? But that's the norm that I find for a lot of people. And the reason is that, as you said, everybody is dispersed. Everybody's all over the place and no one's close again, especially if you're a quote unquote progressive or whatever term you want to use. Mm -hmm. But it has like such a negative effect. And I want to think I'm just thinking about my daughter, like simple things like shouting somebody out at the bus stop or walking in a seat. She don't walk nowhere. Yeah? <laughs> we live in the suburb. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's just, I just want to see how that's going to impact her long term socially. Mm -hmm. Brother, man, you know, part of the power of family is that you're, and also you having a healthy relationship with work, your identity, is that I'm somebody outside of this job, right? So, you know, so whether you are older, and to your point, we talked about identity, whether you're a man or woman, you're like, I gotta go home, I'm a, I'm a wife, I'm a husband, <laughs> I'm a father, I'm a, so even if this is not going perfectly or if I'm not everything that I desire to be, I still have a role and I still have a value that is apart from that. So it's a natural buffer and boundaries, ideally. As a child as well, I'm not just 
you know, part of your idea, I, like I didn't, I remember my maternal grandfather, I was three years old, but my paternal grandparents were, were, were executed in the war. And so I didn't come to see it, but now I see my parents with their grandkids. And part of just knowing who you are is it's like, I'm also, I got a grandparent, I'm a part of something bigger. You also form identity and now you're going out into the world a little bit more full because you're like, I got grand, I got, I got, I got Mimi, Pop Pop, I got such and such, I got such. But to your point, it's completely different. Right. And now you have this dynamic where we're less communal. Right. And so you're going out in society and you have this dynamic where I belong to something larger. I'm being affirmed in a really, really like a conscious way. I know who I am. So I'm going out to the world. I also think that, you know, even at a basic level, when you have children, for example, you have multiple siblings. We always see the pattern of how quickly the child speaks just by virtue of them having people around. So if you have an older sibling, you're going to speak probably faster than the sibling after you. Just being around more people, you even have probably have more social skills. You also are able to n be nimble. There's also a view of even culturally, it's harder for you to act up. <laughs> there's also perhaps a built in more likely reverence for elders. So there's a social building and you, to your point. It's like you may be economically poor, but you're rich. Right. And you 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 there's a there's a conversation. I do this with couples. We have I have this like internal book that I use called 100 Declarations that you need to make before you get married. And one of the things is even talking about like, you know, how do you or school schooling? Do you want to raise your kids in a public school, private school? And one of the things to talk about is even the informal education of like, can I interact with different people? The power of public school and sometimes to say like, yo, we may get the, the book thing right, but interpersonally our child is socially inept. There's something about even that family unit of generations, time where you even their times are different. You're just getting you're just getting socialized in a way that allows you to be more accessible to other people in society. I think that's why. And so your point, we're out here with no buffer. So the triage is when I'm going through stuff or I lose my job, I'm here by myself. If I'm unmarried, man, I got no buffer. And even if I am married, Shoot, who are my kids playing with? <laughs> who are the families? I remember growing up, I, I realized how much I value, and I think maybe people could relate to this. If you had parents who like had friends, and like even if you weren't blood related, that was like that was my cousin. They spent so much time. It wasn't just about you. It was like there's so much time to social matters. We're going to such and such, going, you're going to my you're going now, you know, you, you know that stuff. It's like we're going to Auntie. So much of our social our calendar was filled with relationship management and, and building. And so now you're coming out now, you're like, yo, man, who are, am I even, part of our job, even as parents, is like, am I even setting up my kids with relationships like that? Because I have to be connected with people. And so now, to your point, are they set up socially? To some degree, they have their own dynamic with the social media digital time, them being in a separate place. But then on top of that, our families are not in a rooted community. And so now, whoever your friend is, I don't know their children because you don't have a friend. <laughs> who are married, who have kids around the same age, right? And so even if you're in a community of professionals, as we know today, you know, God, if, if they have children, if they prioritize that at the same time, or if, for example, they're all going, which is a keeping, are they all going to public school? Because some of them go to private school, and even if you live in the same neighborhood, socially you're disconnected for the kids because those kids are all in different places. So there's so many different factors, but to your point, kids are navigating uh, Things in a really, really, it's difficult. It's an uphill battle, as well as parents, to your point. Yeah. And I want to touch on the kid vibe because um, what I noticed that the social skills, I see it with adults. It's shocking to me, though, even though like our generation, because we're in the same class. Yeah. So like Facebook just started, but it was just for colleges after yeah. when we graduated. Yeah. But with this generation now, and, and, and a lot of people are, I noticed that the social skills have like, they're gone, bro. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm a phone person. I talk. I'm not a text man. Mm -hmm. I'm not even an email person. Mm -hmm. Sound and waste still. And people, I despise emails, bro. I hate yeah. texts, but I have to send them. But I know this people don't speak on the phone. They don't meet and speak in person. I'm fortunate enough to have a, a, a strong network where I actually meet people and we chill and talk mm -hmm. and still build. But I know it's a lot of people don't communicate with people in person anymore and they can't. Bro, it's social atrophy. The skills that we talked about it. You know, you develop skills or if, if you have a child that doesn't play with kids or, or get someone around their age, it's a social atrophy. So to your point, there's a skill development. 
during those 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 age that, that that formative time where you're looking to build relationship. My I have a guy, my godson Sebastian. Shout out to my godson. You know, I remember, I remember hearing he had a birthday party or we went to a birthday party and it had a Roblox party. And literally the entire time in this room, these cats are all on iPads, but they're in the same room. I'm like, yeah. But we may laugh at that with children, but how many adults are, are playing Roblox outside where they're out, everybody's on their phone, whether it's club, even going out to dates, everybody, I, we can't laugh at the kids when we're doing the same thing. It's just not Roblox, right? But you're, to your point, you're now not getting the skills. It's like, it's like a muscle, as you understand that if you don't use it, it, it atrophies. And so now you have social anxiety. And so now kids are dealing with real, there are real, uh, people are dealing with real anxiety, but some part of it is contributed to, now it gives me anxiety because I don't have the skills to actually make eye contact, come up and say something, Right. And so for me, my coping was when I feel awkward or I, I feel awkward sounds or I don't know what to do. I go to my phone like a pacifier, bro. Exactly. Hey, I remember I was taking I used to go up to the city when I was down here. I was at Hamilton Station. Right. And I just noticed how much people would take out. I'm a man. Observe. I'm a weird person, bro. I'm like, a, I just like observing human behavior. Mm -hmm. And I just paid attention to the amount of people that just took their phone out just to look at it. Yeah. There was no text. There was nothing. They just took it out to look at the phone because they felt uncomfortable standing there by themselves. Brother, it rewires our brain. And I don't want to say this even when I'm sharing all of these things as though somehow I have overcome it. One of the things right now, if you look at my phone, my phone, I have it on black and white, right? If many people understand that hack, right? The black and white, you don't get the dopamine response. You're less tethered to it because as you're doing it, you're actually programming your brain Right? It's almost like if you kept going through the same movement, now your body's now knowing that as a program. So now when I feel this sense of what should I do, it's now an addiction. It's now wired to me to do that. Right? And so to your point, now we, it, it's, it's, what, it's what we've become. But think about the opportunity cost. As opposed to doing that versus observing, saying hi to my neighbor or somebody's right next to you and being like, hello, that develops skills. It's reps. And so now you do that cumulatively over years. Now take a 10 year old, nine, 10, now you put a whole decade and now put them in, put them out and now how can you have to deal with life and deal with the real world. You have to deal with, uh, you know, how to social skills or how to, how to make eye contact. And this is on top of just like, uh, you know, addictions, pornography, all that. Like I actually have to learn how to interact with human beings. Right. And I, and human beings don't operate like I can manage them. Like I do on social media where I can block them where everything they say is a counter argument, where like I can't just receive or feel like I'm being attacked. You literally see the play out. It's like art imitating life or life imitating art or life imitating dig the digital world, where the skills, it's like when people are speaking in person, they're speaking like they're tweeting or they're interacting in disagreement like they're on social media, right? And I think we're all, if we're not careful, we're all vulnerable, right? If we're in, and so some of even like I think a, a tra tactical thing, I love, Part of the reason I love this platform, man, and I think value, like part of even uh, cutting myself once a week, I'm like off of social media and I've taken months off and I consistently try to do that because like number one, I don't want to be connected to somebody that much, but also I want to have more in real life than digital life. And I always want the balance to be that because I understand that I could fall into that or I think I'm really connected or I know what's going on in my boy's life or my sister's life. If I'm on there, if I cut that away, I have to call them. I have to show up. And I think we all, it's like, it's, 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 it's like four alarm blaze. I think we all need to do that. Or we're going to look up 10 to 15 years from now and not like what we've built and not, and realize like, yo, I wasn't, oh, I really missed that. I thought I went to the park. I wasn't even there, but I felt like I was a part of it. Or on top of that, I don't even know how to deal with things in real time with a human being. And we even see this in relationships now, right? I always think that, I think most people understand most, even whether it's psychologists or even counselors around marriage, even the work to say like your best marriage like friendship is the foundation of marriage well if you don't have healthy social skills or you have not really uh, been skillful in your development then you're not gonna have healthy friendship if you don't have healthy friendship then it's less likely for you to have healthy marriage right because the same forgiveness understanding consistency follow-up all of those things are required now if you don't have healthy marriage you don't have healthy family you don't have healthy family to your point when you ask about neighborhoods now you see the chain just, and that's just one piece uh, that we're pulling in, one lever, one influence, headwind. Now you see how it plays out. And, and that's the thing, it's insidious. We, it's like almost like you, know, you break a, a, a vase 
and you, you look and you look at the broken thing, you don't know what the first crack was. <laughs> you can never put it back together perfectly. That's the, the, the social dynamic we're in. We don't necessarily know what the start was, right? Was it this? Was it policy? Was it this? Was it careerism? Was it the individualism of our culture? I did social anthropology at college, and so a lot of it was like studying culture. To your point, I love to observe. Sometimes I just watch interview shows. I watch things. It's almost like you're doing like ethnography. Just like, what are, what are we becoming? What am I becoming? What's happening? And now when I see the family dynamic, you can't just say it was just the policy of this and getting them in on the house. It was like, it's all of this. And you don't know where the crack started. Uh, please speak about our society's unhealthy relationship with productivity. Before I say I want to be a hypocrite, right? I'm still struggling with that now. I just want to make that before we continue. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think we're, you know, uh, you know I appreciate our conversation that lead up into this, man. Like, we have an unhealthy relationship with productivity is maximize every minute, maximize, everything has to be efficient, right? I think about even the disposition of the interruptions that Jesus had. <laughs> You'd read, like he's walking and he's being interrupted, and I'm like, man, and sometimes he make me even anxious reading. I'm like, yo, man, he gotta get, he gotta get to where he gotta go to. But his, the space of his life, even with him and the responsibility he had, he had made space for the interruption, especially with children, right? You, you, children are the most inefficient time expenditures. You cannot say from 3.15 to 3.30, oh, I'm going to check in and tap in. Or from this is, is nighttime routine. We're going to do from this. And this is me, niece, nephews, all the. It is the most human beings are inefficient. You can't schedule, okay, when my friend's going to call me to say, I need you to pray for me or such and such with the hospital. You don't get to schedule life. But now if you have this optim optimization dynamic, sometimes you'll reframe it in the discussion of boundaries. Or you'll reframe it in a discussion of like, well, I need to make sure that I'm looking out for me and this. And life doesn't work that way. And so to your point, if you just try to schedule in everything, schedule in, oh, oh okay, my, my kid comes in this time, I come in on this on Fridays, we do this. Bruh, it's hard. You, you have to actually make space for unstructured, inefficient time. The challenge for us is with optimization is that sometimes we think that we could do more. It's almost like, you know what I mean, like the brothers, a good analogy is like, brothers, man, we, we, I'm team one trip, man. We go to that grocery store. I'm doing this Costco thing. I'm getting this out the car one trip, right? Like, we, we'll hold that drug as the world's strongest man, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, you know I mean? the, like we try to do so much. It's like, I got 6 o'clock. I could do this, 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 this is beforehand. By 5.57, I could. We do that with life, <laughs> where we try to fit so much in for out of the spirit of optimization that we don't realize, we have no space for those type of things that require that. So, shoot, if I do work, what, and the reality is that there's trade-offs. Love, love is, is discriminatory. You're always choosing love amongst other reasonable, practical options. So if I'm going to go and spend this time with my daughter, I may have less time editing this video. Bro, this, is the, this was a, a liberating thing for me, right? And you know as a person who's um, whatever, ambitious or whatever, I had to come to the terms of what's more important to me, mm -hmm. right? And the reason it was such a struggle was that my brain was so washed with the expectation. It's, how would I say? I guess it's society's expectation of what I should be doing or what I should be achieving. And I had to set the sound away still, right? But I had to set limits to my goals mm -hmm. to make times for other things. Mm -hmm. and that was like a hard it's been very good, but it was a hard process because I was always struggling in regards to like, why am I, sound away still, like why am I doing this? Or also, I could be doing more. That was the struggle, like what's more important than I could be doing more? And it's the sacrifice worth, even though I'm sacrificing for my own family, bro. But this is the conversation that I struggle with internally. And, and fortunately I had good friends where we could have a conversation, but that's the struggle. I endured to get to the point where I really put caps on things I would achieve in my life to make sure I have time for my family and my daughter. Oh, brother, man, I, I, man, this is so refreshing, man, the conversation. Number one, the initial conversation we had about identity and value and validation, that is the ins that's one part of this insidious thing. Because if unconsciously you're, you are working out your value, how hard would you go? I want to be somebody and I need to be valuable, then you're going to go hard, even only inordinately or disproportionately hard, unsustainably hard. One. Two, there's another piece of this, which is margin. 
the reality is that society, social media, all this tells you all of the things you should aspire to. What often doesn't give you a balance or disparate picture of the cost. I remember when I was consulting uh, McKinsey years ago, and I remember there was, you know, I won't even say this openly, there was a um, part, there was a, we were working on a project in Dallas, and a partner was married, and both his wife is a partner yeah. as well. And I remember him coming to the team room in the morning, you know, where we're about to have a huddle and, and do our like strategic planning for the day. And he was just like, man, <laughs> I, mean, I just ran into my wife in the lobby. And I was like, he's just like, man, I didn't even know she was going to be here. And I'm like, like, in my mind, I said, you are in a whole nother city. You're staying at a hotel. You bumped into your wife in the lobby because, and you didn't know she was going to be there. I think from the outside, people would look at that man like, oh, power couple, look at that, blah, 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 blah. But I'm like, confusion, bro. It's confusion because there's a trade off. With those things, there's only 24 hours in the day. And if you have this, if you have this uh, infatuation or healthy relationship with optimization, you think that there is no trade offs. I could optimize this where I have give 100% to everything. And I think whether it, it, there, there's a piece of that that's like, no, it's going to cost you. You can't have multiple priorities. So you got to pick and choose. You got to pick and choose. And that is really, really critical. The last piece of it, I think, is a faith thing. I think faith, my belief and my hope with my relationship with where my faith is, is that I'm not that important. Now, if you are the only one, if everything is ultimately on you, then you can never rest. Then all of your work is everything I do. London Bridge falls down. I hold my world together. If I don't do everything, nothing's going to happen. Versus, you know what? Seek the kingdom of God. I'll be added onto me. I know if I'm doing what I'm supposed to, if I'm loving my wife, I'm taking care of my kids, I'm doing the best I can while making sure my first ministry is taken care of, God, you're going to have to take care of the rest. And I can go to sleep and rest because if there's no capacity for something that's transcendent beyond my lived reality that I could touch, you're going to think it's all on you and you're going to be too anxious to, to actually let have margin in your life. Go to sleep at night, trade off and take the cost because you're going to think, oh, if I don't do this, it's, it's, it's somebody like trying to juggle everything for the rest of their life. It's not sustainable. Bro, that's the realest thing you said. I got to shout out my boy, Peter Salpong. I knew this man <laughs> from high school, right? He's from Ghana. And uh, I, was, to I, Ghana. Used to tell him, I used to tell him certain things. He'd be like, yo, man, yo, just, you know what I'm saying? You'll have time and deal with your family. And like, you know the wildest thing, bro? Mm. You know when I really made that shift, things started really going well. I'm not a Christian, by the way, mm -hmm, right? But mm -hmm, spiritually, mm -hmm. like, whatever is out there. Mm -hmm. A voice told me the moves to make. Mm. And I just feel in my heart that as long as I do those things, other ambitions I have work out. They may not work out to the magnitude I want them. Mm -hmm. And at the same token, too, man, I, I, I've learned in life that you have to be careful how much success you do want because the sustainability of it gets a little tricky and takes away from other things. Mm -hmm. So you have to find – I'm all about sustainable success in a sense. That mm -hmm. Like, you know, things vibe, but I have time for other stuff. But it's, it's, I can speak from personal experience. Mm. When I did what, if you want to say the spirit, my heart, and whatever you want to say did it, mm -hmm. when I did that, things started to work out, bro. And I can mm. like, I can truly say that. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? I didn't miss out on anything. And opportunities started, present to, started to present themselves when I put more time into my, actually fa into my family. Well, I know you you're going you have to help a lot of people with that, man. You know, there's there's the breath and depth argument, right? Where and I've seen this even for myself, right? Um, like I feel like I'm I've been fortunate in my life, very fortunate and favored by God around relationships and community. You know, when I was doing family dinner around the, around the world, man, I was just like, man, I was building so many relationships. But my disposition, part of like my disposition and how I'm designed is like. I, I love everybody like they family. I try to, I'm connected. I'm like, yo, what's going on with this? How can I pray for you? Da, da, da. Not, it's not a production. That's what I knew. That's what I grew up. That's what I saw. My dad cared for strangers. My parents cared for people. And so, but then at some point you get, I'm, I'm not Superman. I'm not all knowing. I'm not omnipotent. I'm not omnipresent. I can't maintain all these relationships to the same depth. And you realize that there's something to be said or some spiritual element of like, who am I called to? And who's called to me? We understand that when we choose our wives or husbands, <laughs> I'm choosing you. 
there's infinite options, but I choose you, which means I'm saying, I'm saying yes to you, means I'm saying no to everything else. But there's an element about friendships, relationships, where you're like, I have to say yes to you, but I have to say no to all these other things to say yes to you. And I think that is a dynamic which is really, really keen. It frees people up a bit to say, you know what? It has to, I have to have something divine behind this or something transcendent. Because if not, there's no, there's no equation that's going to let you know whether you know you're doing it right or not. Did I choose the wrong person, right person? Did I not? I think lastly, I think to your point, man, I love, regardless of where you fall, right, in terms of faith or not, I think a lot of people could relate to this, where you're just on a journey, you're not sure, but you're, you're learning things just from life. Like, yo, I got, when I did this, this happened. I knew for myself, because of my disposition to want to be performance oriented, to want to always perform my value or to be ple- to feel like I'm pleasing God, I realized, man, like something happened to me, man, my 20s, man, where it was just like, man, I lost a friend who passed away. I was working really hard, but something felt like something still was off, even though I was doing the right things. And I'm like, you know what, man? I'll, I'll share this. My father, an architect. He's an interior design architect. He would do the, 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 the interior of banks, major, major commercial banks, trading floors, all that. You can imagine whether it was 2008, 2001, how much 9-11, 2008 really impacted his business. 2008 really impacted the business. Well, you had people, multi-millionaire brothers and sisters, when in 2008 hit, that he knew that were clients that let him, that, that, were, that let him in as clients to actually do the business who, when they lost that money, man, they took their life. I'm like, you are bringing in, clearing $10 million a year. But when you lost that, you felt like you lost everything. And I realized, I said, you know what, man? If I've built my life, whether it's my wife, whether it's my children, whether it's my career, whether it's my health, on something I could lose, I'll never have peace. And I think that is a, like a, a big piece where I think a lot of cats, anytime I ask cats, like, yo, what can I pray for? A lot of times, whether they don't even believe in God, they're like, yo, peace. And I'm like, well, it's hard to ever have peace if your peace is dependent upon what something you could lose. And then when you lose that, you won't even realize how much that destabilizes your world. So I said, you know what, man? If there's ever an argument for, for you thinking about spirit or transcendent or for me in Christ to say, like, you know what, man? I'm good on that because I know that I can't control whether or not illness comes, when a friend passes away, when a job happens, when a 9-11, God forbid, when something happens, if I can't control that, I want to be able to, no matter rain, snow, sleep, hail, no matter what conditions, I'm going to walk out in peace. And so I think everybody wants that. And I think often that's the, that's the major armor for many people, including me, for like faith. It was like, yeah, the math ain't mathing with me having to be responsible for all things I can't control. And if I can't control it, I think there's something beyond my control. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's just a, as you grow and really understand life, you understand how much control you don't have, regardless of what they say. I know we like live in this, you have control. And that acceptance of it is just so liberating. Mm-hmm. The only thing is I'm careful having this conversation with people because people use it to delve into mediocrity. And that's kind of a different conversation. But yeah. You can be very progressive and understand you don't have control. Mm-hmm. You know? But you're not passive. You have agency. Right. It's almost like, man, it, it's, it's it's safe, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you really have faith, understanding, like, I will try my best, but I understand it may not work out. It all, I mean, I don't think sometimes I, I don't realize I don't think we love life enough. Some part of it is like, you know, you hear most of even the writings or you hear uh, people capture end of life. Right. I've done. Uh, as much as I've done uh, marriages, I've done a lot of funerals, right? And I think, or I've seen people at the end of their life, a lot of it is uh, regrets around time, how they spent their time, right? Or I should have done this, I would have done this, I would have done, those are the regrets, they're not talking about the things that they achieved often. And I think when you love life, your view is like, I always say like, man, don't you want to meet the person God had in mind when he made you? Like, you know, what did I look like? I always laugh. I'm like, are there edge ups in heaven? <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, yo, like, you know, what will I look, what was I supposed to look like when whoever created me, for me, God, God, when you created me, how did I look? Like, because you could talk about how do I still do I take care of my body the way I'm supposed to? What were my relationships? What was my family like? How did I operate? What did I do? I'm like, yo, whatever it is, I want to get the be- I want to get everything out of life that I was supposed to get. I don't want to come back and regret and say like, oh, that was for me. Well, I could have done this. I couldn't live with that. And so I think when you love life, number one, you realize like, you know, you realize no matter what people like at the end of life, they get worried. They get concerned because they're like, yo, 
actually, this life thing is good. Right? Like, I want to keep living, right? You know, some people have peace depending on their quality of life. But I'm like, yo, if you love life enough, you want to get everything you, that was for you out of it while, you, while you're here. And that's kind of the vibe. That makes you not complacent. Because if you're complacent and kind of like, well, I'm good either way. And, you know, whether I'm going to heaven or, you know what I mean? It's, it's not my control anyway. But I'm like, but there are things that you can do. And I, I, the, the, I know that this is something that's a, a challenge, a paradox for people. I used to give this example to say, like they talk about my, uh, my abilities and like what controlling things. I said, it's almost like you're, 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 you're rowing a small boat in the tide of God's will. You know, you're rowing a boat, I can move this thing around, but there's a larger tide in terms of what's getting you to where you need to get to. And I think that's usually a helpful way to think about like my relationship between my actions and the ultimate destiny for my life. And it's funny because uh, as a Christian, you're a Christian man. It's yeah. funny how you came to certain universal truths and people come there from different places because I'm all about like uh, exploiting all my talents, bro. Mm. I really just like, I even say with the basketball, I wasn't like no natural. I just work, bro. You get what I'm saying? And like, I just want to like, like really ring out every talent I have in myself while I'm here because mm -hmm. I think that's only right because I have the talent and why mm. would I waste it? Bro. There's a universal real way to talk about it, especially, you know, you make it. This is kind of on Instagram I love who talks about, you know, like everybody has like their cultural cat who makes jokes about how we came up. But it's just like everybody understands, man. Have you ever tried, especially come from an environment like that, you try to waste some food? You know what I'm saying? Fam, better eat your rice in peace. You know what I'm saying? Like you better, better finish that. You're not getting up from this table. You're not getting from this table until you finish your food. You be there at midnight just like, shoot, man, I ain't trying to eat this. Right? There's something in all of us, something of like waste. Right? We make it seem like that's a given. But what makes it, do we, go to, do we all go to not waste school? No. There's something in us that seems that's wrong. There's a, there was a sacrifice. That just seems off. And I strongly believe, I'm like, there's that piece. But I think that speaks to a larger piece. of like, God is not a God of waste. I don't think, I think he's that masterful and that on top of things. Jesus says, oh, let nothing be wasted after he feeded the five to thousand. He fed them. There's food left over. He's like, pick it up. Let nothing be wasted. But there's something about, like, I think everything was intentional. And so when you think about that, like God didn't need B-roll for like the, my movie of my life. He didn't need to throw other people in just like, ah, I need to fill in some scenes so we get them into about 65 years old. I'm like, there's something about in us to say, I was given something. Think about how weird it is. Like when you look around society, do you ever take a step back and think like, how did everybody's operating fit? How did you know you wanted to be a doctor? Or how did you know that she was the one? Or how did you? And everybody's going into the different places in society, not really knowing, but you committed to something. Or like, why'd you do ball, man? That's every, that cost so much sacrifice. Why'd you? But I think there's something to be said about you were endowed with something and it also compels you to do something too, right? And say like, man, you were given a voice. Whitney, why did you sing? Because you heard that voice. You knew something different. I got to do something with this. You saw the way people responded to you. So this, it's this almost this interdependent interplay of like feedback loops happening to say, man, I was good. People say, yo, you, man, you good, man. You saw the validation. You know, I like the way I feel. I like the way I look. I like the way I, and it led you. I, I tend to believe that that is not just, I think that's providence. I think that's just not by happenstance. And to your point, I think there's something in all of us that says like, we're not a people of waste, man. If I'm given this something, which is why, uh, you know, brain or like a, like, a, like a career or something is a terrible mind, is a terrible thing to waste. You know, they, that wasn't a religious saying, but it's saying that you were given something, clearly came from somewhere, which means it had a purpose. And if you don't fulfill that purpose, one of the number ones, the best selling books is a purpose driven life. Right. Why? That was from a pastor. But he's it's getting bought by non Christians, non people of faith, because everybody's figuring out what well, I'm trying to figure out what my purpose is, what my call is. Why is everybody asking that question? No matter what culture, no matter what language all around the world, everybody's asking the same question. That leads me to believe that maybe there may be some it, it, uh, universal pre-wiring. Remember when you used to have the MS-DOS, the, the, those old computers, where it was like, it came with Windows, it came with that? It's just like, I think the operating system in all of us is just like, I need to know my purpose. And we try to get clues from our interests, clues from our gifts, clues from needs, clues from our burdens, clues from our circumstances that, shoot, man, they, I guess they need somebody to, to play point guard now. I, I guess they need somebody to run the, the, the four by four in a relay. Man, I ain't trying to run that junk. I'm trying to eat McDonald's, right? Like, you do and then somehow you then discover, man, I didn't even know. Man, or should we became friends, man? And then all of a sudden, I'm like, man, I like her. It started from something. But I realized that there was something in me that actually led me. 
And, and I think to your point, that's where, again, I think we're not a voice and I think it's actually a divine reality for me. Um, after years working with married people, right? What is the biggest misconception married people have about marriage? <laughs> about marriage man that it that, that it um hmm. this is because i've seen it just the context you know doing premarital and doing mar marriage counseling i think it's that um expectations um not being really explicit almost unromantic about expectations i think you have a misconception that it's um supposed to be it's not supposed to be hard that you always have work, um, that ultimately uh, the person that you're with is always changing, and so are you. And so it's just like, that's not the person I married. Yeah, that, that's not the person you married. The person you married is changing, and they're always going to be changing. Biggest misconception is that your spouse is here to make you happy. Right? You hear so many people now talking about, like, well, I'm no longer happy. Well, I'm like, it's hard enough for people to want to even stay alive single with the suicide rates, or even be happy single. If you could put that in the bottle, you'll be trillionaire. So if it's hard enough for you to figure out how to be happy on your own, what makes you think that a marriage is going to make you happy? And we've become addicted to or we've worshipped the idol of happiness. And so I think more common, what I think is more relevant to people listening now is the idea of like happiness is, is ultimately this, the litmus test about whether or not you should stay married or not be, mar be married or not be married, whether or not your marriage is going well or not going well. I think that's one of the biggest killers in sabotage of marriage is the happiness piece, right? That it's not supposed to be this hard or that. And then lastly, I think difficulty is, is the seasons you get to, don't get to determine seasons, right? If Michelle Obama talked about this and people went up in an uproar. She was just like, I think I went 10 years, I didn't like him. You know, it, that's real. real. talk though, bro. That's real. It's just like, yo, you know, like, I think we're more committed to circumstance than, than our commitments. Like, and I think it's at the end of the day, you're like, yo. Say I, that again, because I think that went over people. We're more committed to circumstances than our commitments. We're no longer committed to our commitments. Everything is fair weather. How do I feel today? How is the stock chart today? I'll see whether or not. Commitment is decided like it's a settled matter. We understand that there's certain friends that we knew, like I'm almost kind of like, yo, that's not my people. It's a settled matter. You, you, you're my guy, we're going to rock. You don't understand how much actually that actually frees you up. But to our point, we believe that, oh, I must have married the wrong person or this is like, no, 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 no. You have to be committed to you have to be committed to the person, not so much the circumstances will come. You know, you go know going in is gonna change. I think the the, the last thing I think is that we lose, and I'm I'm a part of this, even as someone on the journey myself, is that we forget whether you're a faith, that there are people writing about someone. The Gospels, whether, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. There were people who were in someone's life who were with him long enough to write about him. I do so many, I've done so many funerals, man, where you see the funerals where somebody, you could tell whether somebody really invested in relationships because the people that were going up, they're giving remarks. They give remarks like they knew them. And so after the end of the funeral, you feel like you know that person because you got all the pictures. You forget that one of the biggest gifts of staying with someone is that they're the best biographer known to man. They have seen you, and they're one of the witnesses that actually tells the world that I was here. Right? How do you know that Martin Luther King was here? How do you know that Jesus was here? Because people wrote about it. There are people close enough. And what's one thing that we give up when we give up on our relationships is that you actually now have a more chopped record of your life because there was somebody who got the most consistent view than, than more any other people. They see you in vulnerable places. There's nothing that will bring something out of you like a relationship that no other relationship will bring out of you, right? Brothers know, sisters know, right? And so because of that, you're like, they get to see the real you. They get to see you as a parent. They get to see you in your fears. They get to see you in your worries, your concerns. They get to see you when you're lowering a, a parent down into that ground. They get to see you when you're lifting the baby from that, from, from, from that stirrup. They get to, wow, they get this. And so now you now have somebody who has a record. And I think it's almost like hard drive, man. You know what I mean? It's just like, man, like when somebody throws a hard drive away. That's like when you throw a relationship away and you're starting all over again. And so to your point, I think the big misconception is the happiness that you're committed, that your commitment is a settled matter. It's covenantal. And it's something that you need to do. My mother said the realest thing, the only person that really knows you is your spouse. And it's true, though, because you, you, as you grow, you're a different person than what your parents knew, but your spouse 
really knows you. And what I noticed that personally is that what helped me, obviously marriage is rough, especially in the beginning, right? But what I noticed that, or what I was able to do that helped tremendously is that we're taught to put so many, so much effort and work into everything else but our relationships with people. So it's like your career, working out, whatever. And when I actually put effort into my marriage, it got so much better. You get what I'm saying? But it's like, it's like a foreign concept in a sense. Like we, we, we're not taught to put any relationship, any effort in our relationships. That's not at all. And I think, again, your, your number one school for that was supposed to be a relationship, right? And so many people, you know, they're going out, not, they've not gone, they, they're, they're surgeons, but then go to medical school. So similarly, they're going into school of marriage without seeing that, because ultimately that's taught by what you saw, right? To say, oh, that's his work. <laughs> oh, this is right. But if you've only seen people give up, right, it's harder. Even if you have them together, it's it's hard, right? And so I think that's one piece of it. Two, you're talking even about in marriage, you have that same mindset go clearly going into marriage. And so people feel like, oh no, as though somehow you don't have to prepare. You have to prepare to be a husband. You have to prepare to be a wife. It's so counter that in our culture, where again it was just like, oh, everything everything goes. I don't want to be limited to a box of expectations of who I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to do. But I'm like, there's some basic things about learning how to be generous, learning how to serve someone else. Marriage is service, it's sacrifice. If you've not at least been taught at least how to do that in general, on top of the nuance of what it looks like to do that for an, another man and a woman, that's one thing I think in, in particular. In our community, this is something I think, I don't think it's a controversial thing. I think most of us would come from an environment where 80% of us, especially we're coming from an environment where we learn how to mediate ourselves amongst a, a woman in authority because there's often a single mother there. So now whether you're a man or a woman, you're going into the ward or going into relationships under that dynamic of how to mediate with another woman of authority, right? But now for many people don't know men and women are different. That seemed very controversial to say. I think it's, an, it's a divine endowment our disposition, whether you take socialization or just what is innate in us, put that together. So it's like you're speaking a different language. So now I've been taught, you know, I was, was upset with my parents. They're like, you didn't teach me ethic and BBO from Nigerian, you know what I'm saying? You know, but you were taught language of woman, but now you're going in an environment where you're building a relationship with a man and you're like, I don't know his language and I'm mad because I'm trying to force this program that's not working and I'm not understanding, now we're not speaking to each other. So again, that's just one element of, of lack of preparation. We're going in not thinking that we have to prepare. I don't have to do anything. There's no finishing school. There's no wife school. There's no husband school. That was supposed to be a marriage seeing your parents. I'm not sure if you noticed this, right? This is based on my observation. I'm not a marriage counselor. Yeah. I noticed couples where, I'm not saying the marriage had to be great, but at least couples where they grew up with both parents yeah. have a total interaction versus couples where one person was a single mother and the other person was a parent, yeah. and definitely those with both single mothers. It seems very rough. Like Those couples seem to have a very, very hard time more than other couples. Yeah, I mean, I think across the board, everybody gets strays because the divorce rate is what it is, right? Um, and so everybody's struggling, which is just saying that, I mean, even Paul talks about in the scripture, talks about like, man, I wish you were just like I am. Like a married person is divided in their responsibilities. Like marriage is hard, essentially what he's saying. But then you have that dynamic. Now, everybody knows this dynamic where you like back in the day you used to call out your parents for stuff. You'd be like, I would never do that, man. I would never say it like that. Da, da, da. And then you get older, you're like, I'm saying the same thing, right? There's a concept in, in, in clinical psychology, I'm not a psychologist, right, where it talks about family of origin. We do this in marriage counseling, even premarital, which is saying we go through what he called a genogram. And we go through your family history, we go through them relationships, who was married, who was divorced, where was abuse, where was not, where was it. And you do that. And then often people find patterns. And I'm pretty sure in every generation they're not like, I can't wait to bring that down, right? You know? But then you realize like, man, and so when I'm, often you're going into marriage you think that you're starting with a completely clear slate, but typically in moments of vulnerability, you go from what you know, you go from your instinct. And so now you're bringing to say, man, I desire to be married. I desire to be a good husband. I desire to be a good wife, but I've been trained unconsciously to be a single mother. And I don't see these things as single mother thoughts. I see this as this makes sense to me because this is my world. I remember growing up, I didn't have my grandparents. I didn't know what I didn't know because I didn't know what I was missing. My norm was my norm. 
Now when I'm seeing my nephew, I'm like, oh, that's what that looks like. That's what I was missing. So now you're going and thinking your world and what you know and what you're thinking is towards marriage is everything. But you don't realize that you've been prepared and trained to be someone who is not necessarily prepared for marriage, to be a wife, to be a spouse, just not be a partner. You're, you're, you're trained to be that. So to your point, because what are they pulling from? At least in an imperfect union, you still see that they at least had a program that allowed them to be together. So. You, but now you're coming in, at least it's almost like a, in, in business, I like to give these analogies because it helps people anchor it. They used to say, like, if it's not on a deck, it doesn't exist. <laughs> Really like, don't tell me about your idea. Put the idea down. Let me react to something, right? Similarly, you may make up or you may be upset about, oh, yo, your business failed. You did something like, but if you saw something, somebody put something down and you could just iterate from there. So at least I have a model coming in about what works. What are you coming in with, right? And ultimately you have to both, marriage is like, I'm taking a model and hopefully I'm learning what I'm going to take, what I'm not going to take. I'm also trying to be healthy. And then I actually have to learn how to be a good wife or husband. Then I got to learn my spouse, right? Because I can't just apply that. If I was married to somebody else, it requires something different. And so all of that together is why it's difficult. On top of that, to your point, man, our society, and we're part of it, I'm part of it is a very self-centered society. And the core of marriage is giving up of self for someone else. And now if you're coming into marriage, you know, you've been taught that a husband is there essentially to essentially uh, you know, pay bills, and just fulfill your lifestyle desires or provide for you and serve you. And then a wife is just there to just cook for you and that's it, right? You know what I mean? Or that she's just there to fulfill your desire sexually as opposed to I'm there to serve. There's a larger mission for me. This was faith. It's like, it has to be bigger than us. Uh, last thing I'll say was like, um, you hear often sometimes people push back against the idea of staying for kids. One of the reasons why I'm just like, I remember my parents sometimes getting up, they'd be like, we're not leaving, we'll never, and they used to say, like, you know, we're not, you know, my, my mom used to be like, I'm not by myself going to raise, my, raise y'all. No, no other woman's coming near y'all, right? But part of it was just like, that's part of actually, that's noble, that you're also doing something for something beyond you. So people are like, oh, I don't like the idea that you're doing it for the kids. There's some seasons where that's the only thing that's holding you together. There's some seasons where there's one spouse, their faith is what's holding it together because you're weak in that season. There's, there's nothing unknowable. It's actually quite fact noble to say, even beyond my own interests and how I personally feel, I've committed myself to something that impacts other people. And so there may be seasons where, you know what? The only thing that's holding us together is them, right? But I have faith at the end of the day, because it's an act of service, that this thing will come around, right? And ultimately, you've not, the, the point is that your hope is that you want the next generation to be better off, right? To say, okay, well, we've done it. That was our sacrifice, but at least they're not going into the world less likely to want to commit with a less view of how to, what sacrifice is necessary. We're at, we may not think it's perfect, but we at least give them a realistic view of what relationships are. So they're actually going in with eyes wide open. They're actually more well-equipped than other people because they don't have this Lulu social media view that we're going to be happy all the time. This Why did they get mad at Michelle Obama so much when she said that? And she's a married woman. <laughs> like together with someone who's a president and, and she's a married woman and she's happy and she's cool. They got mad at her. How could you ask people to do that? Well, now if I am a, a husband and wife, and we have difficulty and we work through it. I'm like, it may have not been perfect. It may have not been that, but we've given them a healthy view. You know, man, uh, you, you, you mentioned seasons, mm -hmm. uh, cycles. People have a, un I noticed that people who haven't done much in their life don't understand seasons. They think things are just like some highlight reel, and they don't understand, bro. You have your ups and downs, yeah. And it's just a, it just applies. It's, it's a universal concept to everything. Yeah. And um, there's another thing I want to touch on in regards to this generation. I will commend them that. Well, not everyone, but there are a lot of people out there really striving to change their natural reaction to stuff, which you spoke about earlier, mm -hmm. right? So even myself, I had to learn not to react to certain things the way I was brought up or what I was used to seeing. And I notice a lot of people are cognitive of that mm -hmm. and they try to react differently from that natural reaction that may not be beneficial for everyone involved, you know? Yeah, I think it's been a positive thing, right? And so I think I'm a part of the generous. Anytime I'm saying anything, I'm also implicating myself. <laughs> We're implicating ourselves in it. I think that's been a positive thing. I think that the advent of more conversation around mental health and wellness, 
I think has equipped people to say, you know what, right, I think it's healthy for me in the same way that I take care of my body, my brain is my body, my, my heart, my spirit, my psychological state. How do I actually start to evaluate what I've been through, evaluate what I've learned and weigh, and weigh whether or not this is healthy or this is helpful for where I'm trying to go? And the view is we would hope that every generation gets better. It's a newer version of that, right? I think there's two extremes of it. I think the, the challenge, however, is our expectations around how long it takes and actually being fixed. You hear this conversation about doing the work, right? The reality is that that work, you, you have work for the rest of your life. And so sometimes, right, again, it's like there's a difference between somebody who everybody needs work. There's a difference between somebody who had an ACL injury reconstruction, you know what I'm saying, or like a sprained ankle, right? And so often you hear people say like, oh, man, I can't be with somebody who's not doing the work. Well, I'm like, number one, y'all had different lives. <laughs> y'all are starting at different places. And the reality is that your knee may never be the same. And so ultimately, you have to do this work. You're going to be walking with a limp for the rest of your life. And so many of us, the reality is like, do you have proper expectations around your healing? Meaning that there's certain things that you're not, I always say this, like, I've, lo- I've, I've, I've have amazing friends and I've lost amazing friends by deaths, by things. And I'm like, I, I'm gonna, I have a great life, but my life will never be the same. Bro, you got to jump back to the expectation of healing, bro. Bro. Because some people are so broken, they don't understand. You won't get to this certain place that another person's at, but you need to give thanks to being in a better space. Exactly. There's certain things. And I give the, the reason why I give that example around the, the losing somebody is that you know that if you lost a loved one and they were close to you, you will never be the same, but you can still be healthy, right? Similarly to healing, there are certain elements, there's certain things that you go through. Think about it. You could take that as a wound, Right. That actually causes you to make poor decisions, cope with mac, you know, cope with addiction, cope with things because of the pain of that. But just think about anything that you've gone through in your life, anything, whether it was like something traumatic growing up, something happened. You can't expect yourself to be like what is perfect for you. Like so the view may point is like I've learned to be able to handle this in a healthy way. I've learned to be able to cope with healthy coping mechanisms. But if you have an unhealthy expectation, now you're setting yourself up for even more wound, more disappointment, and more depression because you're like, I expect this to be solved. I believe by faith that certain things are not going to be solved on this side of glory. This is partly why I have a heart for God because it's not just that he came, but it's that he's coming back. And it's just like it says, like he says, like he'll wipe away every tear. What that tells me is that even when he's coming back, there'll be still things worth crying about. And so similarly, I think even if you have a healthy faith, healthy life, there are still things in your life that are going to be cry-worthy, difficult. And ultimately, if you're saying that that's going to be indefinite, then I need to at least just learn how to cope with it. So I don't need to have an unrealistic expectation that that's going to be fixed, but that I learn I have a crutch, or I've learned to walk, or I've learned to modify my exercises in lieu of, <laughs> to our point, we're talking about, I can't go out there and do the, you know, you know how many brothers I know that the, the, the blown they blown they Achilles out there. I was like, bro, you trying to act there like you're 15 again. Like, <laughs> we all been there. So I said, you have to make modifications in lieu of some of the trauma or the, the wear and tear of life that's happened. And so to your point, even this, you have people coming in and say, well, you know, healing is just like, you're not fixed. Some of the stuff that you're going through is going to take a lifetime to unravel that, right, versus someone else. So even I, I think I get concerned about the language where people almost weaponize clinical language, right, of like I've done the work or I have somebody who's done this and they almost use it, they use it as a virtue signal to say, number one, you are going to be doing that for the rest of your life. So just because you've been in counseling for 10 years, where you are and that person starting in two years, y'all might be in the same place because of what you've had to deal with and unravel and some of the trauma from decisions you've made and some of the things that weren't even your decision, right? And so when I see this, I think the, the beauty of, of, of um, therapy, of doing the work, is that it actually humbles all of us. We get to look at everybody like humans. We say, we all got issues. We all got work we need to do. Help us better be open to tools that allow us to show up healthy in our relationships, healthy to our children, healthy at work, and I think if everybody does that, you have a healthier society. But I think even that in our humanity, there's still this view of like, how can I show that I'm better than other people? I think that's where it gets unhealthy. Or how can I fix this thing, right? You know, sometimes when you hear about people talk about suicide, it's not so much that they're, it's just that they just don't, they just can't take that pain anymore. 
right? And, you know, especially if you view that, that pain will ultimately go away, I think that is a very unhealthy view versus saying, you know what, I know this pain can go away, but if I know that other people have navigated it and can live a full life with this pain, I know when I think about it, it like the scary things I think about, like, God forbid, if anything happened to my loved one. But some, to some degree, when I look at other people who have lived lives or are living lives that I respect and admire and have gone through that, that makes sense. it gives me some hope to be like, all right, I'll be all right. I can cope too. I'll be all right. I know that they're not, they, you, you may catch them on the wrong day, they're crying about something from 20 years ago. But the fact that I've seen them live their life, I'm all right, cool. I could do that too. I want to talk about a piece you wrote called The Gospel Case for Black Love. Mm -hmm. I, I found it interesting, especially the statistics. Um, there seems to be a double standard in regards to uh, interracial relationships. <laughs> We've had numerous people on here um, speak about interracial yeah. relationships with different perspectives. Yeah. I have my view on it. Uh, we had Dr. Umar on here, <laughs> which is interesting. Yeah, very colorful terms. But, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, please speak about, um, it seems to be a, a, a lot of misinformation, I would say, about interracial relationships. So can you break down your view on it? Most definitely, man. I appreciate you know being able to speak about it. I think just, I want to set the stage by saying, if you are fortunate enough on this side in your lifetime to find someone who is willing to do life with your messy behind, <laughs> that is a gift, regardless of what color they are, regardless of what their background, ethnicity, that's a gift. And I celebrate that wholeheartedly. My concern around the discussion around interracial dating or dating in general is because of, I think, a very public knowledge available dynamic of what's been done between the dynamic between black men and black women, where there's almost been this stoked, for lack of a better word, enmity between black and black women, black men and black women, that's been in part by design, right? To, you've removed men from home. Men from home wasn't just a 60s, 70s thing. Men from home was a slavery thing. It, 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 was, it, it, it spans centuries. And so what does that do? Right, it, 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 it distorts the relationship between the, the other, right? It, it builds in resentment, pain, hurt over generations. It recreates the dynamic of family. And so now you have a whole generations of brothers and sisters who don't necessarily relate to each other in the way that they were intended to. So the concern becomes, why is this the case? And there's information, intentional inf the disinformation around why it's the case. Is it because brothers are just out here marrying other people and it's affirming this abandonment dynamic of brothers don't love us brothers are not here for us brothers are not worthy brothers are something to be feared brothers are somebody you can't build with brothers are everything that the society the society the systematic i call genius evil of what's happened particularly in this country has come to tell you is just like yeah they're the super predators yeah they're that because you also have a heart and you're human if you're a sister and dad was not there. There's an internalized, whether you're conscious of it or not, resentment, abandonment complex. So you feel like brothers ain't here because they don't want to be here because I'm not love. You're saying I don't love and you love those other people. But the statistical reality, it's almost like they talk about the saying like information doesn't change people, inspiration does. You could be the most logical one plus one equals two. But if you're emotionally invested into something, it doesn't matter. And so even statistically, black men and black women, there's not a black love issue. Statistically, there's not. 90%, brothers like 88%, 86%, sisters like 91%, 89%. And people split here and be like, oh, so like by and large, we are marrying each other, by and large. But then there's this view to say, well, the numbers, or the, it's a numbers issue, and like there's not enough black men for black sisters, uh, for, for sisters, it's like, wait, every race, this has this dis ha has this disparity every race has more educated women than men every 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 race has more women than men every race right now it doesn't take away the that the, the statistical reality of, of what's happened because of uh, uh, public incarceration all those different things but that's a common dynamic right across the board and so now you but that's by design because it's wanting you to say, look, look at what they're doing to you. This is why they're not valuable. This is, not, this is why you have this dynamic happening. Then you have things that I think are more insidious that actually really, it really bothers me, which is 
Since the beginning of time, brothers have had to see their families broken apart. Well, then slavery, they've, they've seen. Why do you think people talk about a mixed race? Do you understand? We all know. Why are often there so many mixed race brothers and sisters here in the West when even integration wasn't cool? Because people were raped. People were taken. They were sisters of taken and were sleeping with the one. Brothers have had to see that for time, from time in memoriam, right? And so, so you have this dynamic where the story is being told that these brothers are just going for white women. Every statistical reality shows you that disproportionately brothers and sisters love each other. But now, and so now you have this. Now you have a whole dynamic now where if you're trying to uh, undermine a community, you do it with family. You also have to take into account that at the end of the day, there's a divine anchoring or divine design of men and women. Brothers have been economically castrated. I was going to tell you, I was waiting for you to get to that point, right? Brother. Um, the ability to earn. In American society, a manhood is based on your ability to provide. Yeah. So, systematically, <laughs> if you're not able to provide, like, I just, you know, I give things I could provide for my family. But I also think about sometimes, like, how would I feel, like, as a man if I couldn't provide for my family? Bro. You know, like, how, how would I feel? And I just feel so broken and embarrassed in a sense and there's a flip side you have a lot of men that don't believe they can provide for their family regardless because they grew up in that environment mm -hmm. they don't feel mm -hmm. that we have to understand that in regards to like you never saw someone do it and they're not confident enough to do it and i've seen situations where men self-sabotage themselves from certain things because they just don't believe they can do it that's a, like a factor we have to factor that's the thing we have to factor in regards to black men the role of their environment and that just psychology that they have from growing up in this environment that you're just nothing and you're not capable of anything because you get it from the system and you get it from the sisters or I don't want to say the sister you get it from your community yeah man you speak you're spot on man I mean that's the reality for many brothers right now they can't provide it and they feel impotent they feel like they lack value this is why suicide rates are what they are you see this because I do believe we're called to be providers it is not limit just limited to finances but ultimately, one of the primary ways that you communicate care for family is being able to provide, to do something. On top of that, it's not just innate in brothers to want to do that. That's all, and there's also an innate expectation in sisters to see you in a divine light that that is the provider. And what's interesting, and which is, is interesting, is that even in this environment where things have shifted, even if that, if that woman is not, let's say, traditional, quote unquote, there's still the expectation, which is the, the irony, <laughs> which shows you that there's something to that. Whether or not she's earning or not, she still has the expectation that she would provide. You don't hear brothers talking the same way. You don't hear brothers saying, like, I hope she's taller than me. I hope, because there's something in us that we bring to it. So to your point, it's destabilizing. It's, it's, it's crushing, right, to be able to feel that. On top of that, you have this new dynamic, which is almost saying like there's no distinct roles or expectations. So sometimes they're even being taught that you don't have to provide you. You guys go, for, you know, you roll and roll. Of course, all throughout time, the big view is that, oh, men were providing and women weren't working. Particularly in the black community, it was a mix. Women we were still going, working, washing toilets and doing things. They were still doing work, right? But there still wasn't a dynamic whether he worked on the, 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 the plant or not. There was still a dynamic of like, I see value of you beyond just this. Yeah, I think that's the biggest shift with this generation in regards to that. They totally disregard the man based on his economic ability. Because he because they hadn't they, they didn't have the opportunity or the fortunate opportunity to learn about the value by seeing it themselves. Yeah. And so if all you see is if all he was reduced to was the check, was the check or the ability to to procreate and create me or facilitate my life, then when you're going into the world, that's all you've limited men to that. So that's why it's like it's not just provision, it's protection. It's also like, it's also direction, vision. Yeah. It's also correction, like correction, divine correction of children, structure. It's, it's more than that. But, <laughs> but all right, all right. You, so, you, so you know white male suicide is skyrocketing yeah. because they're struggling because a lot of these men, they're not doing better than the, they won't do better than the previous generation. They just can't deal with it because their whole place in society is, is, is kind of topsy-turvy too. But, me and my brother talk about this a lot, right? That some people, especially if they have a solid woman or I'll say a conscious woman, you can supplement the income with guidance of the children, support of her cooking and cleaning, 
other things. What happens with a lot of men is that they're so stuck in this provision thing and the society is not allowing them to provide in that way and they're not kind of seeing how else can we make this thing. I, I think that's what it is. Mm. They're not seeing how can we how can we win the game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. From a sports term, I guess. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. bro, you're off today. You can't. Are you going to help defense? Are you just going to cheer on the bench? There are other things you can do to support the team. Exactly. And I think that's where we need to transition to say, you may have, have households where, yes, men make money. You may have households where the brother just doesn't have skill or may live in an area where he can't earn. Mm -hmm. But what else can you do to help the family thrive? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, brother, to this point, man, I mean, I can't help but this is often for me the invitation to faith. Because if your value is gonna be dependent upon what you can do, and there are times when you can't, then you're gonna be working out your value. And it's gonna be a fluctuating thing versus my value is endowed and it doesn't matter whether or not I have a job, I don't have a job, I, don't, I still have a motivation because I'm, I'm coming, I'm working from value, not for it, right? And I think that's difficult. I think to your point, it's a dual flow. And if I, I'm speaking to a brother practically, I'm saying at the end of the day, nobody's going to do it for you. You know, you should want to be able to care for yourself. But I would start both with the spiritual to say, number one, you are valuable. That's not a question, right? That's a hard thing, but that's a faith thing. When you don't feel your circumstances validate that, you have to know outside of your circumstances that you are valuable. But why? Two, to your point, is also your decision. I, I, I believe part of being a man is accountability. I call biblical, you know, biblical man, I talk about it's accountability. God talked to Adam, man. Like He was like, where are y'all? Like, I think that's part of what is distinguishes brothers, is that you're called to be accountable. The wife you choose, right? The woman I choose, right? Does she value me? I remember I used to struggle with the even idea of like, man, ministry. And like, man, if I do a ministry, then does somebody value that, right? Will they look at me as less than, right? Versus when I was investing in banking or doing consulting and I'm making all this and I'm doing all that, right? Then I need to be with a woman who actually values that. Because to your point, you could see the value, but it will be difficult, not impossible, if the other person is just like, I know you're here trying to clean and do that, but brother, brother, uh, T-Mobile don't take cleaning, right? Like such and such don't take, right? And again, I would still push that man to say, hey, you, you, you should be able to take care of yourself. You should be doing that. Do what you got to do at, by any means necessary, right? So if you have a license, you have this, drive Uber, drive this, there's no excuse, accountability. At the same time, always having a posture of, I can make a choice the wife, the person that I'm with. And then ultimately to grow, to say, what are the other elements of manhood that, I'm, that, that I mean, I mean, I didn't get to choose my family. That's what people are struggling with, bro. The other elements of manhood that they could demonstrate to help the collective, bro. I think that's the biggest problem. And I'm not blaming all women, but a lot of the sisters, man, they're so stuck in this mind frame of what manhood is. Mm -hmm. And it's shifted. I'm, I'm not talking about no feminine vibe. I'm talking yeah. about being a man and providing, but there are other things men can do based on their position in society. We already know certain positions positions are limited for black men. It mm -hmm. is what it is. Mm -hmm. So with that understanding, you gotta work accordingly to make the ship work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think, uh, and I think, I mean, I have compassion, right? I think they're coming from a similar environment, right? And as I believe, I believe men and women are different in how they handle it and what they're gifted to handle, what they're called to handle is different than what we're called to handle. I think to your point, the, real, the, the, the reality is that some part of the issue is because we live in a society where every, it, it, everything is idiosyncrasy. We're afraid to say, what does it mean to be a man? So if, if you're everything, then you're nothing. Like if, if I love everything, then I love nothing. If I'm a, my, everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. We, we've gotten away where we don't believe in roles, we don't believe in, but, but we're also trying to define manhood. You can't, if you don't believe in manhood being distinct from womanhood, then we can't even have a conversation of what it means to be a man. And so everything in society is going towards, there's no such thing, everything counts, all that. And here's the thing, there's something to be said about everything is unique. We're not reduced to the, the clothes we wear or the depth of our voice or all that. But I do think there is a invitation about what specifically it means to be a man. And the being a man is not everything. And I think you can't have it both ways. You can't, it's everything or it's nothing. And I think that's part of the issue because I think there are brothers who, I think brothers generally desire it, but they're confused because they're getting confusing messages, right? That nobody told them. So you're usually taking the program that you saw or you learned. All right, I saw somebody provide, 
right? And typically, it's almost like going to a church. There's never a perfect church. One church, their worship is good, but their, their, their preaching may be sung. One church, their, their preaching is good, but the worship is good. One person, their community is great, but those things are eh. Like, but all together, you have everything you need. Similarly, there's never going to be a perfect dad, right? So everybody who's talking about, well, my dad or my parents were this, there's no perfect parents. There's some parents who they provided well, but their, 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 their quality time was, ugh. Some people were the quality time was strong, but I didn't have everything. I didn't have all the Jordans coming up. You have to view that in terms of even what it means to be a, f- a father and a man. To say, okay, what is, what is my clear understanding that I believe in? Right? That is, and, and when you have to say manhood, you have to say that's separate and distinct from womanhood. Because if it's both, then it's not. Right? And I do believe that I think man, it starts with accountability. I do believe that you are ultimately accountable. That's a nasty word these days. Oh, brother, bro. man. Uh, I think that. Because I think it's in the image of God. I think that you look at Jesus, and if you say Ephesians 5 for people of faith, there's, a, there's just a, a passage that talks about that men in marriage are like the Jesus figure, and women are like the church. Well, who is Jesus? He was the one who took accountability for all of our stuff. He was just like, I'm responsible. Even though he was responsible, he was just like, I'm responsible. So he took it upon himself. So we are actually a shadow of that in society to say, you could believe that Jesus is real because in, 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 in a, um, a marriage, I'm the one laying down my life. I'm the one providing. I'm the one covering. I'm the one covering with the blood that we're covered by the blood. I'm covering her. I'm doing all of these things. And she receives me. It's even seen even in terms of like even the sexual act, right? A woman has to receive me. I pursue. And so I think that's, I think for, for, for brothers, you have, to view, you have to have some model. For me, I think biblically, there's a picture of what it means to be a man because Jesus came embodied as a man. And I think studying his life and looking at that, I do think accountability and responsibility is big. I think the provision is big. I think all those, but they're all together because he spent time. He dwelled. He didn't throw Bibles down from heaven. He, he, he walked with us. He spent time like a father should, right? And he took responsibility. And I think, I think there's nothing worse than feeling hopeless. And so even if you, let's say, if you take that not of faith, there's nothing worse than feeling your life. You can't do anything. And what I'm saying is that I think the power of manhood is that you have a choice. You're, you, you, you have agency, brother. You can make choices. That's your power. And you, if you're saying, ultimately, I'm responsible, you, it's the most empowering place to be because you're never just sitting here, woe is me. Right? You say, okay, I can do something. I can provide. And it's not going to be dependent upon, okay, she may not respect or value what I'm providing. I have some compassion, man. She didn't get to see that. She, who taught her how to do that? I got to model it. I'm going to just do that. She may get it on this side of glory. She may not. But you know what? Brothers kind of like, she doesn't determine my happiness. Society doesn't determine my value. They don't determine my happiness. That you can get up, regardless of the circumstances, and live a full life. Man, I think that's, that is the, the call for anybody who's a child of God, but especially for men, right? Because I think everybody moves off of that. So if you want to start society, get communities, when you get the brothers right, the, something people will relate to is, um, you know, a lot of times they're like, man, there's no women in the church. There's no brothers in the church. There's no brother. Even when we do happy hours, there's no brothers anywhere, right? But here's the thing. You have a, a community or you gather some brothers together, you'll never have an issue finding sisters. But if you have a full room of sisters, you probably, you may have issues where you don't see any brothers. That's, I think, society and that's community. If brothers are the, if brothers are, are the anchors, you're, you are not going to have any issues getting it together. So if you are stand up and anchor up, the women will come. The community, the families will form. But if it's the other way around, which is what we're living out, it wasn't the design. Brothers were supposed to be leaders. We're supposed to be the foundation, like Jesus is the cornerstone. We're supposed to be the anchors of our families, the anchors of societies. And that's what shows the genius evil what they've done. But I have hope because I see brothers, you, some people who are turning around. You do it in your own life individually, but collectively, you're doing things that don't just benefit your family. You're like, yo, this is going to help some young brothers. When you even try chatting, I was inspired, man, because you're like, man, I want to talk about this because your, your orientation was like, this could help such and such. That's a communal vibe. There are a lot of brothers who have that communal vibe. You know what I'm saying? And I think you do that, that's accountability. No one's going to fix it for us. We're going to do it. That's manhood. And I think brothers need to not be afraid because even you get pushed back from sisters being like, they'll try to tell you what it means to be a man. <laughs> T.D. Jake says to me the other day, he was kind of like, he said this during the Father's Day thing. He was just like, women, you can't tell a man how to be a man. In the same way that I can't tell you how, what it feels like to give birth, you have no idea what it means to be a man. Especially, you know, in many contexts, many of you have not seen that. So I think brothers need to take pr- healthy pride. And, divided, and the idea that we, were, we have a unique purpose, 
We have a unique call and we have a unique responsibility. And that's empowering, right? And I think that will motivate brothers to say, okay, my mother gave me the best that she can give me. My wife's giving me the best she can give me. And they have an incomplete picture. I need to do the work, seek out what I actually believe in and what makes sense. I always say, I'll I'll close with this, man. Like I give, um, every brother needs to have three relationships, man. You need to have counsel. Well, that's one of the major relationships. Who is the, like, who do you look up to, man? That you're like, yo, I wouldn't mind being more like him. I wouldn't mind if that person corrected me, gave me guidance. If you at least have a model of that, then at least you could actually do the, the inventory of like, what is it about them, right? Is it because of the way he loves his wife? Is it because, okay, he's, 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 he's stable financially? He's in shape? Brothers, brothers move off of brothers they, they want to be more like, that they respect. Please speak on the myth that you can achieve your way to happiness. Oof. Brother, man, that's, the, uh, that's one of like the universal challenges, man. And it's something I think I believe for a long time, man. And I remember I wrote this sermon like, uh, your attachments matter more than your achievements. Like the quality of your life is dependent on the quality of your relationships, man. Um, Hmm. Interestingly enough, I think one of the things I always said is that like if you built your life on, 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 if you built like the quality, your identity, your value on something that you could lose, right? You're like, you'll never have peace. And I think brothers and, and sisters in particular come to this place where you, there's been so many stories of people saying it. Like they got what they thought they wanted. And then it's like they get there and then it's a whole nother, they're like, wait, this wasn't what Jim Carrey talked about it, Madonna's talked about it, where it's kind of like, I thought I needed to make this much money. I thought I needed to do this. And then when they get there, they realize it's unfulfilling. Or they have now a new thing to say, I got that now, this is that. So now I thought 10 million was everything. Now I'm poor because now I can need to get to 100 million. And it's just like, man, I, I always ask myself the question, why are those extra wealthy people, or those people who got all those things, why are they killing themselves? Why are they dealing with addiction? There's so many people I went to school, school with who had all this money in the world, but they were the ones that they were doing the drugs or the high-end oh, yeah, drugs yeah, or doing yeah. all this stuff. And I'm like, but they got the things that I want. And so why, you know, and so you realize, I'm like, man, is that these achievements don't mean nothing. I think as, to your point, the team is helpful, meaning that I think all of us want to, all of us want to live forever. What I mean by that is that you know, legacy. We hear brothers, we talk about legacy, man. Like, who am I? What is my name? And so a lot of times, achievements is because you want to make a name for yourself and you want that to follow, right? But then you realize often the only way to really live forever, right? And, and that desire for legacy is like through people and the impact you have on people. And you realize like at the end of the day, this is fool's goal because I'm going to, there's always going to be a new level that I'm going to try to go through and I'm going to be unfulfilled. And even if I get it, I feel anxiety about keeping it. So then there's no, there's no getting off the hamster, uh, the hamster wheel, right? And again, I think this is an invitation for brothers to consider about faith. Because I'm saying, if everything of my lived reality is achieving and attaining things, and then even when I attain the things, I now have anxiety about keeping the things and not losing the things, where will I ever, people sleep, but they don't rest. Where will I ever be able to have peace? And again, the number one, que- when I ask brothers, what can I pray for? The number one thing is peace. And so it does, and all brothers, whether they have been financially constrained or they have, they have the fruits of, of some real labor financially, they have all been saying, I'm looking for peace. And so what do they all have in common? Maybe unconsciously the belief that the achievements, I can achieve my way to peace. I think, man, that's one of the, the biggest tricks of capitalism. I was at my lowest point when I was the most successful in the eyes of society. Mm. And I think that um, a lot of people, they they hear this story, so they believe themselves that if they acquire status, wealth, or any other thing that they're told, that that will heal all the pain that they deal with internally. And I can tell you, bro, like personally, like things got real dark for me when things got real good. And I'm not talking about no self-sabotage. It's yeah, not yeah, like, oh, I don't feel deserved. Yeah. I'm talking about in regards to what I believe that achievement will do for me or what I felt the accumulation of this wealth would do for me. I'm glad I experienced it early, so I got it out the way. So I give thanks for that, right? But at the same token, I can say I was at my most insecure and lowest point when in the eyes of society, I would be like the most successful person. Brother, man, you, you, when I say you help somebody, there's a lot of people gonna be helped by what you said. There is, um, 
everybody knows, man, I don't know if you had siblings, man, growing up. I had siblings, man, and you know, you have uh, four of us, right? And we all greedy. <laughs> and you ever like go out to eat and then you went to Sizzler or something like that? And then like, you know, uh, remember shot to Sizzler on Route 1 by Menlo Park back in the day. So, <laughs> so you, you went to Sizzler and you had some food left over. You know what I'm saying? And you put that joint in the refrigerator, man. And then, and, <laughs> bruh, ate that, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And you spent the entire day, man, you in class, man, like the thing's ringing, you're not even paying attention. You like, you just thinking about that sizzle, that teriyaki chicken or something like that you had. And then you go home and you've been setting up this crescendo of like, man, when I get back, you finish practice, not even talking to nobody. You get to the car, don't have gas in the car. You're like, I got enough. You get back home and you go in there and you anticipate and you open that joint. Gone. And that joint is gone. <laughs> the fury, the not even just the fury, the the gaping of your soul, bro. You're like, cause you're anticipating this thing. As funny as it is, bro, it is so similar. Because you've been building up. And it's like, it's like your life. That's hunger. You may have starved yourself on purpose because you wanted that thing to be, mm, I wanted to taste everything. But you've often starved yourself and you've starved your life. You've missed things, missed the time with your children, missed family stuff. There's stuff that maybe you can't go back in time and get back. You've missed things. Miss your own personal health. Miss your own health. personal health, bro. I've looked at myself at times. I remember that there was a period of time that I was not sleeping. I look at the lines in my eyes. I can't get it back. I've seen aged. There are people who I remember who are a friend of banquet and they doing well, fine. But I'm looking at them, I was like, was it worth it? Like it's like a ghost, right? Because it, it's aged you. The weight. The weight. It's aged you. The weight, the this, the disconnection, the alienation from friendships. The man, I missed the wedding. Uh, shoot, how many kids been born? Dude, you know how many friends I know? A friend whose like father was so well done, but he hates him because he was never around for any of his games. So now you get to that place and that's the hunger. And then you're like, okay, well, I'm seeing all the trail of bones and the trail of bodies along the way. At least let me get here and have a good meal. And you get there and you reach that plateau and achievement and it's not there. Because now you're like false bill of goods. And then look at what I sacrificed along the way. Was it worth it? And then when you had enough honesty with yourself, enough courage, and I call it testicular fortitude, to be able to be honest. There's a lot of people who they know the truth, but they can't come to terms because actually coming face to face with what they sacrifice of themselves, of other people around them, or what cost, and that's assuming somebody with high integrity. I wanna say one thing I have to add to it, which is a very important part we can't leave out, image. Mm. People get so uh, addicted to that image that they created, that persona, they don't wanna leave it. I can say that me personally, I was able to, a lot of people when I left the industry I was in, they said I was crazy, this and that. And it was rough to leave, but I was willing to walk away from the image that I created because the image that I created wasn't me. I had this character, bro. I really created a character that was praised and I created it to be praised, but the character wasn't me. Mm. Mm. You remember we talked about earlier about love and I was saying like, you know, like we're all made for love, we all made for love. Not necessarily romantic love, but we all made to love. Think about often, so often, this is not for everybody, how your life changes when, for example, let's say you were talking about resources. Let's say the achievement was the financial resource and stability. Your life changes a lot. The people around you, things change. The expectations of you change, right? Especially if it's exorbitant, you know, or the, the dependencies or the expectations or, and I always think about this. Sometimes it gets very hard to discern love when you have so much. Because I, it's almost like the dynamic of my mentee, a few of my mentees are in the, in the league. And it's just like, why are you here? Are you here because you love me? Or are you here because you love what I can do for you? And so it'd even be harder to even choose a wife, to even know why did this family member I never talked to come back? Are they just around because they know if they ask, I could do this? Or to your point, the image, now I have all these people, I have this power, but it's not really me. And so now in order for me to maintain those people and things, I have to be somebody I'm not. It's like, man, 
everybody when you're younger at LeBron, honestly, we ever told a lie before. It's not even a lie, bro. Keeping that lie is it's like 50 tabs open in, in your Chrome. Like it's 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 work. And it's like you you better off telling the truth so you could be free. Similar, it's like you better is you better is it better off living the truth so you could be free. And so I actually that's when oftentimes when people ask questions about celebrity, particularly those with a lot of resources, why are they making this decision? Why is this happening? Or why did it do this? I have so much compassion because I'm just like, we all have that, that deep desire to be like known and loved for who we are. Like we want people to say, good job, you're somebody. But not based on my, the peacock outfit I have on, but based on who I truly am. And we're all manifesting it in different areas of our life. And so I could definitely relate to that. I can understand it. Like, do you, all of us are playing tests, whether it's in life, marriage, friendship, work. Like, are you really here for me? Right. So again, I think that's scary. Going back to that idea of like, I've really built my entire life around this end of achieving these things. And I get to it and I realize it's not worth it. Uh, another thing I'll share, I think will be relevant and poignant. We talked about family and community, right? This all, all of this ties together with what you're saying. We're told to get things together, to achieve so that you could set things in place. But I think that it was well-intended, horrible advice. I think that we should have been investing more in relationships, right? Because now the operators certainly talk about the big rock theory. You got to put the big rocks in first, then you put the sand. Because if you put in the sand, then you can't get in the big rocks. You have a dynamic where you have a whole generation. Our generation is the first one who we're really going to see the real fruit of those decisions where you're like, we're trying to put in the big rocks for later. And now you're realizing like life, like, shoot, I thought my achievement and this is great, but I got nobody to share it with. Or shoot, now when I have a family, but it may be too late, right? Or I mean, I'm, right? And no, no one, this is very, this is hard. This is the uncomfortable truth, but this is like, the, this opens us up to healing or at least being able to cope well. We, we confront the truth. Now you're sitting in it and be like, shoot, I didn't know why I'm depressed. I'm depressed because I'm really, I actually come to terms with the fact that I, I have traded, I've mortgaged what's most important for an achievement that I realized and I open the refrigerator door and that, that fulfillment is not in there. That's what we're seeing, right? And so to your point, think about the implications. So now you have a whole side of unfulfilled where we built. That's what sells. I mean, that's what Instagram, social media, we all sell. It's the success, the, the achievement, the accumulation. So you now actually have something. People don't, I said people don't get married for, for marriage. They get married for the wedding. The photos, so you could show all the things, the achievements, the achievement. Look what I've achieved. People become achievements. So as I always said that if no one could show their spouse, more people would be married. Because now if your spouse is a validation of what you've achieved, then there's only certain people you'll be with. It's almost like saying, I will only drive a Porsche. Bro, say that again, yeah. Say yeah. that again, yeah. Say that again. If, if your spouse is a validation of your achievement, then there's only but so many type of people you want to be with. It's, if, if it's a resume builder, this spouse validates that I'm beautiful. So now, for example, if imagine if I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a young lady where in my life I felt like no one thought I was beautiful. But now I'm considering someone to, to partner with. Right? So think about it. In every other area of my life, and now this is applies to brothers too, you know, I get, you know, I'm successful. I got to have the markers of success. I got the range. Right. I live in Alpine, New Jersey. Right. I'm wearing the Louboutin, the red bottoms. Boom. I got the hair flowing. I got the pictures, the airbrushed, whitewashed, you know, photos on Instagram. I got all that link in bio. I got all of that. That is the last piece. So it can't just be I can't just be that I'm getting the 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 the, the, the Stacey Allen. Or I'm getting the Zara shoes. Because people don't know what the Zara shoes are, but they know what the Louboutin is when I put the red bottom on. I can't just get somebody that I may like. I got to get somebody that everybody would say, oh, that's good. And so even or not, whether or not that's attainable, well, you, need, you are validating my beauty, my success. So you need to look the part. So now you have people, male and female, saying, I can't. There are people that you'd be amazing partner with, amazing husband and wife too. But because... There's a thwarted view of yourself. There's a thwarted view. I know society accepts that beauty. I know society accepts that man. I need to be with him. So now the idea that you're telling me that I can't be with that, 
is like saying that I can't go to Harvard. It's like saying that I can't go to these things. It's saying that I can't get the range. I want the best. But we're talking about human beings, but that's the best. You just summed up the toxic dating culture. And that's why people say there's uh, a lack of available spouses, but that's not the case. That's you just want case. something. You don't want a spouse. You just want something to show off or validate you. That's like somebody saying, you have a car that you could afford. I will, but no, you, you have $50,000 in your account. No, I want, I'm not going to drive a car unless it is a range. And all subject to it. I'm, I'm not just throwing on it. I'm all subject to it. And I think even if you've gotten married, some part of accepting the gray and the messiness of your marriage, the, the confronting the fact that, wow, this person is a mirror, but they, they got issues or they see the issues in me, you know what I mean? Or they're not always, sometimes you got to reconcile and redeem that even in real time, right? To your point that you ask a question, I think we're all, I think it's hurt us so much where we don't see people as humans anymore. Or I think to, your, to the point we talked about value, if I have an endowed value to myself, I don't need or I have a less reliance about outside validation. So, for example, you know, you know, growing up, I love relating to the joint. Like, <laughs> we used to go to people's houses of like, <laughs> when if they ask you to eat, say, if they ask you if you're hungry, say no. Right. You know, it's almost like I don't want you walking around here like we don't feed you at the house. Right. And so if you you full, you go out to the world less hungry. Right. Um, I think there's this dynamic of like. If I'm full with I am endowed, I am valuable, it's not dependent upon what my boys say, what the people say, what this, this is my wife, she takes good care of me, this are my kids, this is what I could afford, so I'm not going to uh, get a lease for $900 when I could afford this $200 one, it may be the Camry, but cool. You, you make different decisions the more secure you are in who you are, right? And so now you're going to make a different decision on financial, career yo if i actually i really love teaching kids and i may not have all the instagrammable stuff like that but i not just love it i feel called to it i'm saying this to myself then there's a view of you know what man i love that woman loves me she respects me that's love for men we know she respects and honors me she may not look like and this is an internal thought. I'm not saying we say this publicly. This may not be in your head, but now you're not. You're able to make sobering decisions. Or that brother cares for me. He may not. He may not be making 500k. He may be, but that brother cares for me. He's faithful, and like, we would make so many different decisions if we knew our value. We think we know our value by saying, "No, I know my value. That's why I need to have that." No, that actually is evidence that you don't know your value. <laughs> no, that's a, that's, a, that's a brilliant thing. And one more thing I want to add in regards to that. You see that insecure behavior? Mm. It's compound interest because you just keep getting in a deeper abyss of insecurity. Mm. And once you start, it'll be hard initially to make secure decisions mm -hmm. and be comfortable with yourself. Mm -hmm. And you consistently work on it, you'll become more secure. Mm -hmm. But people don't start that. They just keep with this. They keep doing things that make them more insecure. Mm-hmm. Bro, when I used to be in the city, clean, Farragamas and all that stuff. Shout out. I was so insecure, bro, compared to now. That's the wildest thing. I had everything on that I guess you're supposed to have. Yeah. And I was at the height of my insecurity. Bro. A lot of times people may hear this. I don't think particularly your audience. I think your audience is learned. <laughs> <laughs> um, but sometimes people may hear this to say like they, they're saying that we, don't, we shouldn't have good, nice things. Not at all. Not at all. It's your relationship with him, bro. It's the relationship. It's like, it's like good things. It, it, there's this concept of idolatry. And typically people think idolatry is like worshiping golden calves and photos. And No, 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 no. It's when you make good things ultimate things, right? To say, like, I love my child, but if my child, yeah, I worship my child, right? You'll crush your child because you'll be like, you can't fail. You can't do this, do this because you have an unhealthy relationship. The good, now you took it to an extreme, right? It's the same dynamic where it's kind of like it is good but like is it only brother i used, i could relate man there have been times when i'm in like i was so tied to it I'm like i can't go to this thing i've got nothing to wear you got something to wear but you want to wear something new and you may not have the, the numbers may not be, be you know at the end of your, your month your actual is the way it's falling you're like shoot i may i may not be able to get the new fresh this and this and this to wear this because they see me in this so you're literally going to forsake Going to this very important event and to spend time with these people because 
you need to put different cotton fiber on your body. Even though your face is the same. Just, you just, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like, you know, it's like, get it. You're like, you're on a plane. I can understand a different experience of it, but it's like, we all go into the same place. They just, st- they're sitting up a couple rows up, but we, get, we at the end of the day, we're still going from A to B. That's, that's, that's the authority. That's the cost. That's the collateral damage of it. It's not just like the insecurity, which is an internal thing. And like, yo, bro, your mindset's off. It's like, it actually costs us things. We make Finances, decisions bro. or we do things and we don't do things. We overspend, we underspend, we devalue people, we overvalue people, we overwork, right? I often think that even some vi- uh, sometimes the conversation, though I think there's a valid conversation about having uh, your financial affairs in order as best as possible. I think there's an over, sometimes it's a, it's a cover for our relationship to consumerism, which has become another God. And so there's this idea where it's like, oh no, we need to have a month of money, you know, or, or you know, cost of living and we need to, yeah, things are expensive. No one's gonna argue all that. But I'm like, what do you really need to survive? How are you living, bro? How are you living? And so if your idea of survival is that I need to have these cars, I need to live here, we need to be able to do these things, things, you don't wanna cook, none of y'all. So you're sitting there like every day you're eating out and spending like $100 a day on this or that or that, the consumerism, it blinds you from actually what's sustainable, right? And so you don't know that. And so now you're overworking or you're overspending and you're like, yo, you don't have a, like, these are not, these are not uh, keys of your success. These are not validations of it. If you're secure to say, yo, no, we, we can, we are, at the end of the day, what's most important? To your point, attachments more than your achievements, your relationships with people, your relationships matter more than your achievements because those things are last. Those things actually give you value. And so at the end of the day, you say you get the car, you're riding where the fuck? Because you want somebody to see it. Right? And I always say, like, yo, I give this idea, like, I'm finding this more and more the more I'm living my life now. Where it's not that I've always been ambitious, right? Brothers, I'm, I'm like, it's like a lion ambition. But, like, it's a different ambition, right? Where redirected. it's redirected. I don't care as much about like the, oh, the grind, the grind. I work, I get up early, I work out, I work. But it's just like, I'm not trying to be successful. Like, like I just, I wanna have a life. I wanna make sure that my parents are taken care of, that I can spend time with my wife, that we can have children, that we can enjoy life together, that I make love to my wife, that we enjoy, we go out to eat, we enjoy our time, that things happen in the world, I can share it, she can come back, I can snuggle with her. You know what I mean? I could be out with my kids. I could see them develop. I could laugh. We could watch movies. Like the things that actually like that I care more about is relational based as opposed to just a, a, attainment based. And I realize I'm like, those are the things that give color. It's like the black and white. You know, when you see those things where like they show the old black and white and they put it in color, right? Like the relationships give color. Like they, they bring it alive. They make your life alive. And so I'm just like, and I, you don't want to learn that too late. And I think you realize now the past five years, my relationship, because of the pandemic, I was running around taking care of people, family crisis, stuff like that. I got disconnected from a lot of even my, my out of core relationships. I'm like, no, I'm going to I'm going to double down because I know that at the end of the day, I'm never going to be regret that investment because the people, the people, man, is what makes it, bro. First of all, before I even ask you, I advocate for people to work out, right? Whether you walk in, I know people at different uh, places in their life mm-hmm. more than anything. I just. I always tell people to just at least walk or go Mm -hmm. outside, right? Um, I heard you speak about uh, this concept of the spiritual gym. Yeah. Can you please explain that? Yeah, I I think we find that we're often very intentional about many areas of life. I always think that in order for you to be healthy, you have to be spiritually well, relationally well, and then physically and mentally well, right? If any of those areas are off, everything is off. If any of those areas are vulnerable, everything is vulnerable. And so I think a lot of times when people talk about wellness, they talk about the physical, right? Like I need to make, you know, the mental. They're like, I need to mentally be okay or relationally I need to be okay. But I think the, the idea that spiritually the same relationship we have, the same intention we have, it has equal implications as every other area of our life, right? And so I thought to myself, I said, well, a lot of times people get frustrated about faith, especially when they think about faith, because it seems so abstract. Like, what am I working towards? If you ask somebody in a New Year's resolution, I'm trying to lose 50 pounds. <laughs> you know, I want to be healthier. It's very tangible. And I think for a generation which is like really has valued education, there's a difference between education and common sense, right? <laughs> you know, we're all liable, 
right, you know, whose values these things, we're often motivated by things measurable, you know, measurable impact, right? Like, okay, I, I, it's great, whoop, like the digitized self. We see this even in the industry shifting, where now people have got my Apple Watch on, I got my whoop on, I wanna see my progress because you measure what matters. I can't manage what I don't measure. I think there's a view around recognizing, I think people have been more open in desperate times. People take desperate measures around how to be well. And they realize, like, I think the spiritual is important, but it seems so abstract. I can't just get a, a sermon that makes me feel good and go on. How does this have impact practically for my day-to-day -day life? So part of the spiritual gym is actually just about intentionality to say, in my areas of my spiritual walk, what are my goals? What are the steps I'm taking? It's just like a muscle, right, to, to, to pray. To have faith, there's an exercise of that, right? And so there are people who are not, people use the term, are you spiritually healthy? That means that there's a such thing as being spiritually unhealthy. What are the steps for me to maintain my spiritual health? And so I think it's taking the same dynamic around everything to say, I want, to, I want people that be, work, be intentional and in working towards something in a measurable way. And the idea was saying, in the same way that I deal with like a doctor's office, in the beginning of the season, to say, all right, let's do a diagnostic, right? Almost like you would do a test, the diagnostic to say, where are you, how are things are from a prayer perspective? How are things in terms of just, uh, you know, your, your study of scripture? How are things in terms of just your faith? And I break down like basic areas of life financially and in the spiritual implications, where are you? And then based on what's happening in your life, okay, let's, what are just three things we're gonna focus on? And actually it's like personal training in spiritual. It's okay, great, right? It seems like you're struggling to talk to God or you're, you're struggling to open up or you don't have really space. You feel like really combusted. And there's a lot of things you can't express. So let's, we're going to have dedicated times of prayer. We're going to work on this. And we're going to work on your ability to do it. Some people, like, they, they pray consistently, but they don't know how to ever be mad at God. So I'm like, yeah, I could pray, but it's always like, you know, go, Lord, I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm like, but there's stuff going on in your life that you're angry. And part of your maturity spiritually for your health is being able to recognize that God can handle even your, your unhealthy thoughts, your unhappiness, your disappointment with him. He's big enough to handle that. So let's teach that because that's going to have implications for your life, right? Or shoot, I'm still dependent. I don't have any self-control, right? When I want to say something, I say it. I've hurt people, right? Even, ex even exercise, even fasting. Fasting is about letting your, your, your physical man be weakened and your spirit man be strengthened to say, you, everybody got to eat. And if you could regulate and say, you know what? For a spiritual matter, I'm, I'm, I'm lessening the power and the influence that this has over my being. Some people say, I can't help it. Oh, you can. So part of the way I strengthen it is one way is through fasting, right? So, I, I, so these are things where I'm like, you're actually taking steps and we're walking through like a doctor's office or like a personal trainer and say, now you actually have a plan. Some people, it's a foundation. They're like, yo, my story was, I got to my, I was in my 20s, man. And I'm like, Lord, I grew up going to church, but like I went, it was more cultural. When I went to Presbyterian church, I know what was going on, like, but faith mattered. We prayed. It was a Christian home, but I didn't really know the Bible very well. And I remember I was, I was just like, I always say, I thank God for everything in my life. And I remember being 27, I was in church and the, and the pastor was like, turn to the book of Micah. I didn't know where that thing was. And it was at one point where I was just like, I talk about my intellect and God giving me all these things, but I've applied my, I've applied my gift my thinking, my mind to everything, anything and everything but my knowledge of God. And that flipped. And I think a lot of brothers and sisters relate to that, to be like, I feel so smart in my trade and what I do. But when it comes to faith, part of the reason why I don't jump into it is because I actually feel vulnerable. Like, I don't know what I'm talking about. And so I think at that stage, I realized that I want to stop faking the funk. There are many brothers and sisters who are kind of like, I just need a plan. How, what do I start with? Right? Some people call it discipleship. And so I think part of that is like a spiritual gym to say, it's your... Think about your, your health. Could you be perfectly healthy? People could always say like, no, there's probably, there's always another health level of health. That's spiritual health. Until, until God returns, until Jesus returns, there's, you go, you're jumping into a pool that's infinitely deep. Every day you're trying to get more and more healthy. And so in the same way that I'm not gonna stop working out, I need to keep working out for the rest of my life and eating healthy, there's the same dynamic for your spiritual health to say, I need to have a goal, I need to work towards it because that's gonna motivate me, but I also have to have healthy expectations. Am I gonna arrive? Part of the reason I think some people struggle with faith is because I'm like, you feel like you need, it's something that you don't graduate from. And actually you realize the more you know, the more you don't know, the more you realize, actually maturity is greater dependence, not independence, versus in society, every aspect of our life is, the better I get at something, the less reliant I'm upon that thing, or the less I've graduated now. Faith, 
you know, the person who's like really, really in shape and healthy, they can get more nuanced about how they manage their health. They've advanced, but they're more dependent. And I think that's what people need, because I think people now, that's, they're realizing like, this is not enough. I think we've seen it even on social media, brother, like you, you find in desperate times, whether it's financially, health, people losing family, losing loved ones, you, you're like, I need to make sense of this world. And you look at the tools thus far to say, whatever I've been using thus far is not working. And so you become open to more of the spirit things. You're like, okay, it seems like this. I'm just open because I'm trying to get an answer. And some people do extremes, but I think more than anything, it's nothing worse than getting there and feeling like, okay, so what, what can I do? I want to, I actually, I have energy. I have a motivation. Help me. It's the view of discipleship. But part of the view is saying, all right, I do believe there's a model. And this model's around. I think there's a brother in Detroit who is, who's now trying to systematize a little bit to say, that's what you're supposed to be. Where actually you have a plan. It's not just about coming to church. It's about making, that's the word saying, disciples. That everybody's a student or an ambassador and is always trying to learn. I just think that we don't have enough models of, that are structured to help people do that in a way. And I think I treat, I treat it like personal training, man. I, I, I love it that way. Because I'm an athlete, we're athletes and I, and I think that people respond to that a lot. Uh, many brothers have lost a close friend in their lifetime and have not dealt with the loss in a healthy manner. I'm one of them, mm. right? <laughs> Please share healthy ways brothers can deal with grief. Mm. It's tough, man. You know, I know what I've lost. I've lost brothers who've passed. I've lost brothers who are living. I think brothers could relate to that. Um, what I will say is that not everybody doesn't grieve the same. Grief looks different. There's not a book. There's many books about grief, but grief looks different because you have a different life. You have a different relationship with that person. You have different tools. But what I will say for brothers is that no matter what it looks like, you have to have a process. You have to have something to grieving, right? An ideal case is that I think often for many brothers, it's a fear. Let's talk about the barriers. The barriers is because of our mind, we're very utilitarian. What good is this? <laughs> what good is me crying out like, what, what good is this going to do? Is this constructive? So we don't see the value pragmatically. Or like if I'm just sitting here and cry, let me just move on with my life. I don't see what good is that. And I think that's a barrier that I think we have to acknowledge because we know in our wiring, that's kind of like a, a weakness to say, I, I don't see the benefit of that, right? But we, what, what's also scary is that you also don't see the damage because you're blind to it. You think it's normal the way you're responding to such and such or the fact that you're down, but you don't even know. You don't even know how you're sideswiping people or how you're driving out of your lane, right? And so I think that's the, the other side of it to say, I don't see the value of it, but I'm like, yeah, you don't see the detriment either. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is that um, sometimes the fear is I don't know, I'm afraid of that. I don't know if I'm gonna come back out from that thing. Like if I open that up, I'd rather not open up that Pandora's box because the feelings that are associated with it, I'm scared. No, none of us, uh, I'm brother, I'm kind of stoic brother, you know what I'm saying? And sometimes you don't, the reality is like sometimes there's a lot of fear to say like, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know how I'm gonna come back up from that or it hurts that bad. Everybody knows, let's talk grief. I'm gonna hold this up and keep going with this. If you ever had a heartbreak in your life, brothers, man, it was just like, you know what I'm saying? Everybody remembers the Waiting to Exhale soundtrack. That was for everybody. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, baby. You know, like, <laughs> or, or Cam, can't stop. Like, every brother or sister knows the, when you had a heartbreak, a real heartbreak, that it's a physical pain. And you feel like you about to die. <laughs> but that's grief. And sometimes when you feel something that scary or you felt that before, you're like, I don't want to do with anything near that anymore. And so sometimes that's the reality that I don't even want to do that. I think what brothers can do is the reality of saying, like, I think there's step one and then there's ultimate. One is setting your expectations that this may, I, I may have this grief for the rest of my life, but this grief may not, it will not have me for the rest of my life. There's a difference. And so meaning that, you know, especially if it's a loved one, that means your heart works. And so I may have these feelings and I, it, like, I may have these feelings, but I will not be for completely consumed by them. It, can, it gets better day by day. It can. It may not be linear, but I have to have the right expectation. If I have an expectation that it's going to go away or that I'm never not going to feel bad or I'm never, or I'm just going to overcome it, 
and not feel anything, you're setting yourself up for deeper darkness, right? So to have the expectation to say, you know what? It's actually a testimony that I loved well. I cared for them, or they had that such of an impact. Man, anytime brothers know, man, anytime sometimes I see some Kobe interviews, man, I, hey, you know what I'm saying? It's, 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 it's tough, because I'm just like, Kobe had such an impact. That hit brothers. That was the first time for many brothers that they publicly were open about their pain. Similarly, well, that's Kobe. You ain't related to him, or you ain't. So if there's somebody in your life that has that standing, there's a view to say, okay, I have I, 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 could, I could do that. I think that there's other piece around now, having brothers, because brothers oftentimes, whether you have a brother or not, I think often they're the greatest first step to share, right? To, to share and just be honest about that. And, and I think because brothers know, brothers know the nuances of kind of like sharing it, often a brother who's been through that before, right? Who's unnavigated. I, I know a brother, you know, one of my one good, good brothers, man, who like lost his wife, widowed. And it wasn't until he spoke to another brother who lost his wife that he kind of was like, he's able to breathe a little bit more because he saw somebody living and he moved on with his life. And he's, because he knows, he knows what he's been through. Especially when you talk about grief, loss, brother loss, somebody who's lost as well. Internal, some brothers may be hearing this and be like, hey man, well, I don't really got cats like that that I can open up to. We talk about process. There was, in the Bible, it talks about when Moses passed away, they, they had 30 days of mourning, grief, like 30 specific days. And after that, they moved on. I'm pretty sure cats are still crying after the 30 days. But their point was that they at least had a dedicated time. And so the, the, the illustration I always give is like when you break a bone. If you break a bone, that first few weeks to, to when you actually do the surgery and set it back in place is critical. Because if you don't set that in place, it's going to heal in the wrong direction. And you may have a limp or you may have an ailment that stays with you or it's a lot more pronounced. But similarly, that 30-day period or that period at least to acknowledge is almost like setting the bone in place, right? To say, I'm just acknowledging that. And every day doing something, it could look different for you. You may be like, man, this song reminds me of my boy. Or I'm just going to be sitting here in silence. It may be five minutes. I had a, a couple of cats that I've been, I walked through, walked through grief. And we actually spent every day, the, the accountability was every day we did something for 30 days. And after that, I'm like, you can do what you want, right? Some days for them, they annually, they memorialize it. Some part of it, they, like, they do something different or fun on the day that reminds them so they can continue to redeem. But they had that 30 day period and it was like light night and day. You have to do something. You have to do something. Because if you don't do something, that something is doing something to you. A lot of black men have left the church who grew up in the church, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you found solace in the church later on in life. Why do you feel Christianity in America is not capturing the hearts of black men? Mm. Man, this is a layered answer, and I'm going to do my best, right? Because um, if anybody had the silver bullet, I think we would have addressed it in this way. There's a number of issues. Some of it we addressed. Because the church is a representation of something, <laughs> right? Uh, the, the church is not so much the institution. The church is, is called the called out people of God. E Ecclesia is the, the Greek translation. It's a people. And a people is like operating like an organism, which represents the, the entire family of God, right? It's a body. They literally use the word body. And ultimately, the church, the, these gathering grounds, what's become an institution, is a place where locally, all those people come together to encourage and help each other, right? Stay strong in their faith and also be sent to care for those around them. It's a family. It's a representation of a family. It's a representation of God. In our community, one element is the dynamic of what's happened to our families. Because again, it, a family, home, marriage, home, family is a training ground, right? We always say your relationship with God affects your relationship with people. Your relationship with God affects your relationship with your father. Your relationship with your father affects how you see God. Often, I always felt like, God, are you, are you not pleased with me? Are you not? I was always trying to impress because I wanted my dad to be pleased with me. Unconsciously, I didn't realize even when I thought about God, even before I got deep, that often I do things and I think about God as in like, is he happy? Is he not happy? Like, it's this dynamic woman, sister, her relationship with her father affects her relationship with her husband. 
It's this pass down from father, parent, child, child, parent, this. It affects all of our relationships. So you have a dynamic often in churches where there's an authority figure, right, of someone that you're called to trust, to receive, to listen to. If you're not necessarily coming from by, I'm giving generalizations. It's harder to receive that when that training ground wasn't a safe place in the way it was supposed to be. God, your father is a representation of God. This, like, who do you, who are you? This guy got his issues too. Who are you talking about? And he's asking for money. Or is this? It's one. So that's general. So a lot of brothers, there's a resistance because the figure of leadership in that context is somebody that I don't necessarily relate to or trust in home, which is a training ground for everything else in the world. That's one. I think two, we've also seen the fallen nature of it too. Because many brothers in, at least I'm talking about the West, because if we talk about the church globally, globally missionaries are being sent here. (laughs) That's why why it was clearly America. Exactly, America. So you understand, so many brothers were stripped of their dignity and manhood in our community. One of the few places, particularly in the West, for men to affirm who they were was the church, where they were now respected or they had authority. You've seen that in a healthy way. You've also seen it in unhealthy ways, where they reduplicate. Sometimes you'll see the, even the, the, the posts, the posts they seem like club flyers. I'm like, who is this? You know, or I am the man now, so now my humanity is showing up in my ministry, that I'm using this to purport. And so whether people see the view of this person is doing much better than them, I now, whatever I can get my hand on to affirm that I'm a man, even if it's the church and it's the pulpit, I will do it. And so now you have that resentment. And so there's a suspicion about, I'm not sure you're rocking with that. Number three, because of that absence, you only affirm and replicate what you have. So now they're predominantly women. What you have sometimes in a dynamic that many brothers express, whether publicly or silently because they can't, is that often the church seems more attuned to, to the black women's ear than it is for brothers. I, I tip my hat, right, because I think, um, I think I believe in common grace. Common grace is the idea that Christians don't hold the key to all wisdom. I believe God holds the key to all wisdom, but God does amazing things to everybody, whether they believe in him or not, God, but I believe God is the cause of it. That's general revelation. I think, for example, like you see the who's done this very, very well in terms of affirming the man and speaking to the the felt reality very effectively, you'll see even in the nation of Islam. You know, whether you had fruit of Islam and how they trained up men, they've done a good job, and that was during the time, even Malcolm was on the block in Harlem, they're speaking to the felt day-to-day reality. And so for many brothers, they feel like what you're speaking about seems disconnected from my day-to-day reality. I do not see other brothers, and again, brothers like are driven by, oh, are there other brothers I respect? Or are you other brothers that are telling the truth? Uh, I give this context, we were talking about sports before. The coaching, I believe because of how we're designed, I think brothers often even socially are step into rejection a lot more often than our sisters. Not saying they don't have rejection, what I'm saying is that if you're the pursuer, you're most likely rejected more, right? And I think sometimes I think, though we all are dealing with difficulty, I think the statistics, you can't argue with how brothers are suffering more in jail, more suicide, more things, die sooner. <laughs> like it's, har- it's harsh. I think we could t- deal with tough coaching a lot more easily than I think sisters could deal with tough coaching. I think brothers are tuned to that. There's a certain type of teaching that we can handle. Some brothers can listen, they can listen to Minnesota American. Because they can listen to TD. Or they can listen to them because they speak, because Dr. Miles Monroe used to talk about this, um, uh, A.R. Bernard talked about it, it's like fathering. Great pastoring is fathering. They speak like fathers and they're not afraid to tell the truth. A lot of brothers have been turned off by what they call it pandering. Because brother's not there, it feels like you're not telling the full truth, and the only time you tell the truth is to beat up on us. But you don't necessarily hold the sisters accountable, you don't do this, and so it seems like brothers are like, number one, are you speaking to my lived reality? How is this practical for me? 
If I can't have a job, what are we talking about? You know what I'm saying? What are we talking about? How are you helping me to be a better person? Right? The gospel does do that. And so I, I believe that the church does have them. Number two, there's a way that I could receive. And I think you'll see the churches, there's been a number of books written about this. Churches that are often tailored to men have no issues of balance, but churches that they feel tailored to women do. And, and I think a lot of people are going to be very defensive about what I'm saying because it's almost like if you're in a house, you're there, you don't know how your house smells until somebody else comes in it. And I think there's the dynamic of being able to see, and I'm like, wow, I didn't realize even the, the, the examples that we're using, even the references that we're using, it seems tailored to a woman's ear. Well, it makes sense because if it's 80% or 70% women, and they're the ones who are supporting, they're the ones volunteering, then I'm going to be particularly attuned to making sure what I'm saying works with them. And, hey, you know, I heard a lot of, I've been to church since God knows when, but I heard a lot of conversations, and what I noticed is that from an economic standpoint, bro, you got to mm. uh, cater to your clientele, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And like, I noticed pastors that, I remember I went to a uh, baptism. This was about 10 years ago. I forgot, one, one boonie place in Maryland. And I was really impressed with the pastor, to tell you the truth, bro. Mm -hmm. I really was. Like, he was really breaking down in regards to like healthy eating and, and preaching accountability, but the place was empty, right? And me and my brother always had this conversation like, a pastor may start off where he is giving a message that would be appealing to a man, but can he keep the congregation full with that message? The yeah. majority, even men, we know there's a certain amount of men that don't want to hear that either. Yeah. Like, so they're kind of put in a place where it's like, you start off with this fire, but then it has to get diluted to keep the seats filled. And that's the that that's the the, the pushback because I want to be very clear, especially you know these things we, we eclipse and whatnot. I think. Um, there are churches that are doing this well. And I do believe if you do it faithfully and do it well, Arab Bernard, there, there was a New York Times article in the 80s. And he had, at one time, it was like 70% men, black men, Brooklyn. There was, you no seen anything like it, similar to TD. You, you don't see, because they, they were faithful in that. And ultimately, they, they were, they're tied into the felt need. Brothers need structure. It, it was structured. Like, again, these are things where anyone who doesn't understand the nuance would be like, it doesn't mean this is the only structure. No, it's, it's, it's very unique. And also, at the end of the day, it's almost like you follow someone. This is when you people see the Instagram. We're drawn to somebody we want to be more like. I remember when I saw this man, like, I remember going to um, um, CCC and stopping by visiting the first time in like 2007 in Brooklyn, in Flatlands Avenue. And he reminded me, it's like, it's like my father. He was not just the suit that booted, it was the fact that he was like, he was a smooth guy. Like he seemed, he, he seemed smart, attractive, sharp as a knife. Brothers wanna, it's like brothers, we are made for mentorship. We wanna be around or we wanna learn from somebody we wouldn't mind being more like. And so if somebody doesn't see some there, themselves in that person, then they're less likely to follow them. I'm not gonna follow you, where are you gonna lead me to? I saw them, I was my dad. I was just like, yeah, my, like, and so I, I received from how he was breaking stuff down. I was just like, if I, I, I wouldn't mind rocking with this cat. Brothers need to see that. Now, here's the thing. This is why we say it's nuanced. To your point, not everybody could receive that because you're part of you, you being prepared to hear a fathering voice is being fathered, right? So certain people, like we talked about recruiting, they can't, they won't go to certain coaches because those coaches coach is hard and they want to go to the one who dotes on them or stuff because it's more like mama love. Right versus daddy's love is often it's more it's more it's, it's difficult. Not saying that it doesn't has to be. What I'm saying is that it includes that. Right? He chastens the Lord chastens those he loves. He says. And so I say that to say like there are examples of those who do it well. Right? I think there are there are there are generational gifts to our community. Right? Um, and that's why I shout out Arab Bernard, I shout out T. Jakes, I shout out uh, uh, Tone, Dr. Tony Evans, Dr. Miles Monroe, that he brothers, sister, everyone loved, not everybody, but like they appreciated, but had men. And I do think there's something to being a congregation or being a gospel that men could respond to. I think it starts with number one, you being a man that it could respond to, meaning that you're a man who actually submitted to God, that you actually really lived that life. And then ultimately, like, you show that you genuinely care about men and that you actually give an attention to men. Because the truth is, man, you know, women and kids, right? You know, it's the Chris Rock joint. You know what I'm saying? Where it's kind of like crying women and kids. 
that the society only, and, and even, even so that our, our sister, even the mother will often push back against this because it's, it's like a, it's almost like a survivor's remorse. The reality is it's like, no one is going to care for brothers the way they would have uh, empathy for sisters and kids, women and children. And so brothers, at some point, it's an opportunity is what I want to leave with and would hope is that I talk about mental health. The reality is brothers know whether people in society, whether our sisters would admit it or not, no one gives a dang, man. Yes, philosophically we do. <laughs> but empathy, we come, we're last in line on the empathy front structure, either whether it's just black men in Western society, even in our community. And so I think because of that, it's an opportunity to be the one place the church is supposed to be, the hospital, man. The one place to say, even though the world is telling me I'm not worth nothing or that I'm not valued or that I'm not prioritized, you can tell me that. And then churches which prioritize, like you are a leader, you were made to be that. Don't care what they say, you come here, you serve. You have a place, I think that's the opportunity. The church is a place that you could help make men, make disciples. That's what I said in the nation, I got right. If you even see A.R. Bernard, he had a men's ministry. Man, he had that place structured, you think it's FOI. The security audit, brothers. The people who show up armor, brothers. They need structure, bro. Brothers need structure. That's what I'm saying. Like even the spiritual gym, it's not a spiritual gym. The concept, you know, and I'm putting this, uh, this is the, the work even that I was on Dallas to doing. It's like a new community, a new church model. The model is like, you not only have the fellowship area where people could break bread and have dinner and meet for meals, like it's the new dining hall for adults. You have a co-working area and then you have a gym, a wellness center. And literally, all under the same roof, and you do that all there. But then you're, you coming in to the church, we're not just asking you to just know how to learn scripture. You need to be well in your life. That's part of worship. Working out is worship. How you treat your relationships is worship. How you uh, uh, have your relationship with God is worship. So then this brother gets a holistic picture that actually helps him to say, yo, here's your, here's your, here's your God. We're gonna work on this spiritually, we're going to work on this relationally. Your marriage is struggling. We're going to help you out in that counseling. So these things are all exist, but people don't see it within the context of their faith wall. That's your faith, right? It says like, man, dear guys, I pray that you're, you're doing well and that you're in, good, you're in good health, even as your soul prospers. That's a scripture. He's just like, I pray that you're in good health, even as your soul prospers. What he's saying is that your physical health in my heart, when I think about you, is just as important as your spiritual health. And so when brothers say, not just be in shape, but the fact that I'm valued, the fact that relationally you're looking out for me, brothers need to have that. And so I think that's an actual opportunity. And so I'm excited to be a part of the generation of brothers who are kind of like, no, no, no. We get that. But I think brothers now are realizing like, okay, we're, we're now more open to their health. They're recognizing that what they've done thus far to your point, achievements, oh shoot, somebody ate my food. <laughs> and then lastly, I think they're getting to this point where I think brothers are like, yo, I think we're, we need to prioritize brothers because they're the leaders. Hey, before you leave, I just got to tie in two things. One thing is you spoke earlier about um, people leaving the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And when people leave the neighborhood, that examples of men that they would interact with is not there. I think that's that access. I think information is so segregated and examples is segregated. Mm -hmm. When we talk about segregation, we mostly talk about economics. We don't talk about examples. Mm -hmm. That solid dude that you would see, don't live there no more, bro, right? Yeah. Another thing I want to add it on, I just want you to delve in more in regards to uh, because men are com becoming very feminine, not necessarily like homosexual, but in mm -hmm. regards to their ability to take information a certain way. Mm -hmm. It's a burden on society, but it also seems to be a burden with the church. It like it, it affects it's like the education system, bro. Like people try to separate it from the ecosystem of society and what's going on there is affecting every institution. Mm. Mm. So what you were saying earlier in regards to you have men that can't there, you know, I, I'm pretty sure you experienced this. Many men probably feel like intimidated by, it, or you can just see, they just feel uncomfortable. They're not used to being around a real man. Yeah. And yeah. I can see how now that can hurt the church so much, because if you have a pastor, who's a real man, why would you, you'd be thrown off to it in a sense. Yeah, man. Bro, you know? man. I uh, mean, the most real I can say, man, it, it breaks my heart, man. But it also gives me, I'm like very compassionate for it because that child didn't choose, man, like how they came up. And you're, it's foreign, right? To your point more, I would say like, I never had my grandparents in older age. I don't know what I'm missing. 
I don't know what that dynamic is like. And so if you've been only attuned to a certain voice, you know, the first time, you know, you hear about that child that didn't hear and then they put the earpiece in and their eyes light up because it's the first time they heard sound. For some people, they're hearing that sound for the first time and it's very foreign. And it's like, you think it's a whisper, but they're hearing it as thunder. And so I think the reality for brothers, especially when you're taught that love is the way a woman delivers love and that love cannot be correction. Love cannot be um, rebuke. Love is only affirmation. I think, and I'm saying this to say, anyone, it's like having just one a wrench, and like sometimes you need a Phillips head. You, like you don't, you don't have one wrench, you're limited in your use. Both together, you're able to now be the, the, the person you were designed to be. And so the disproportionately, people, we hate, we, we, just, we really hate the statistics of it. There, there's, we're out of balance, we're a community out of balance. So most brothers and sisters only hear that voice and they believe that that's the reality and that's what's right. So now when they hear that, it makes them uncomfortable. They feel resistant. And also another part of this brother, man, that I think is really uncomfortable, but I, that's why I'm real casual compassion for, a lot of the time it comes from abandonment and rejection. Hey, what I learned is um, when I started teaching, right, the young ladies used to give me the hardest time in high school. But what I learned is that uh, first of all, a lot of them never had a male black teacher and, and they definitely never had a strong male teacher because mm -hmm. a lot of male teachers in there, they, they act like women in the sense of catering to mm -hmm. them and there's mm -hmm. no accountability. But what I come to learn is that one, this is the first time being held accountable by a man. Mm -hmm. They saw it as abuse, bro. Yep. They didn't see it as love. They literally saw it as because love for them is happiness. Everything is okay. There's no... There's no correction. There's no accountability. But when I hold, when you hold someone accountable and you actually want them to do better, it's almost it's viewed to them as being abusive. Brother, this is why I keep, uh, and this is why I always want to be holistic and clear and comprehensive what I'm saying. Right? You need both. And there's a there's the, there's a scripture God says is like fathers, be careful not to exasperate your children. The exasperation is because he's like I know what I put in you, so you can have a tendency to go <laughs> to be too much. And like there's a perfect, it's a harmony when you have the affirmation. The masculine and feminine. Exactly. Really you have that. The, exactly. And there's a such thing as that, right? Even though society will tell you it's not. And so to your point, you're right. That's foreign, right? It's like somebody who's never been loved well. Like they'll sabotage that joint because all they've known is the, the trauma, the drama. They're like, this don't sound right. This don't feel right. What are, you, what are you saying to me? Oh, you know, we ain't arguing. So you don't love me. It's just like. That's because that's what they, that's the language of love they've learned. That's been imprinted in them. And so now if somebody's not, oh, he's not trying as hard, he ain't fighting for me. Because I, I'm not going to yell at you. I'm not going to, and, and vice versa, right? You know, and seeing that. I remember realizing, I'm like, yo, Nigerians, we're very like, I think he, he, Jamaican, but I think we're very like confrontational. Animated. Animated and confrontational. People are like, why are you yelling? I'm not yelling, right? <laughs> But again, it took me kind of now being out of my environment of what's normal to realize that, okay, maybe I have to modulate this because this doesn't work. I think, number one, we have to also recognize that like, it's, it's, it's jarring. This was their entire life, their formative time when they put that, their formative time. And that's what's, you know, uh, fallenness and unbounded, meaning that you can't contain, we talked about like a vase breaking, you can't, con you don't know how many shards and different pieces are going to break into. That's what happens in a world that's, that's, that's not the way God designed it to be. Is that like literally from like Genesis 3, Genesis 4, like you have Cain and Abel. <laughs> like it just gets worse and worse and worse. You're like, golly, man, yo, we need a savior, bro. Like it builds up to Jesus coming. Like it's so bad. It gets worse and worse and worse because humans being humans is not good, right? Similarly, you have this dynamic of like what, you know, you see how unbounded it is. The level of like damage that's done. But you're hopeful, right? Because to your point, some people will get it. You know, there's a, a story of like dropping like seed on hard ground, on rock, and some is fertile soil, good soil, where the seed will take in the wisdom. There were some people that you probably taught that like it was hard, but sometimes they, some of them, they got it. Some of them, it may not be you, but it'll be the teacher number four male that will break through. But your work helped break the, the ground, right? And so I, I say, I think to your point, uh, it's important. I think last, 
The rejection piece, I think, is keen. And I want to say this to brothers or all of us, I think, especially if you felt consciously, and this is if somebody went to therapy and had the terms, if you felt rejected, so let's say, for example, you don't show up in a typical masculine way, right? Typical masculine, everybody, I think, would understand what I'm saying, which is like, you know, if you, if you show off, you show a little bit more feminine, and you felt that your father was not proud of you, was not pleased with you, was like almost like it seemed like he wasn't happy, and so you never lived up to, you never got that, this is my son, I'm really proud of him because I'm not like him. That internal resentment towards that traditional thing is, is called like, um, it's transferring. Like I'm transferring that resentment or that feeling of rejection from that one or whether he wasn't there and he just was not there and you didn't think he didn't want you, I'm not transferring to all the male relationships. So all of them that show up like that, whether I'm conscious of it or not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling that rejection, so I resent or I don't like. And so I'm only gonna sit in spaces that affirm. And here's the thing, right? Uh, I have a view about our highest identity. And I say this to brothers, I say this to sisters, I think whether you're a brother and you've had to navigate this and have gone through that and have felt rejected, have done that, is that your highest identity is far beyond your sexuality. Your highest identity is who you belong to. No matter what you do, you are that, you are that man's child you are the most highest child. And that that's the identity that, the war, that gives you your value more than anything else. And I think that's also a first step to actually being able to heal, right? Because often they're giving you the best of what they know, right? And even sometimes it's the fear of that. And also number two is saying at the end of the day, what we talked about before, full circle. I can go out to seek value, but that ultimately is not my value. So even if my parent is imperfect, I could still be valuable and I could still show up even though he may not give me what I desire. That's like people who come to the stage of saying like, can I still move forward even if I don't get an apology? It's like, you know what? I'm coming full. That's where the faith thinks. I'm coming full where I've been forgiven. I could forgive them too. And ultimately I don't need him even though I desire it and it hurts because I do have a heavenly father who endows me with something that no one could take away or validate. That for many people is usually sometimes where they come to the knees and say, you know what, this faith thing's for me. Because I'm, if I keep waiting, it's gonna kill me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so yeah, I, I, say, I say this, I'm saying this with compassion, really understanding what uh, brothers are going through. I've been fortunate to have an amazing father. Um, but I can only imagine what it feels like to not have it. And so I just pray to the brothers, man, I, 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 my heart is heavy, but it's not the end of the story. And as accountability, you, ha you can make a choice every day to heal. And I think it starts with you, most importantly, recognize you do have that power and you can experience healing. That's my hope. People speak a lot about women struggling with receiving correction from men, mm. right? Uh, why do you think that's the case? Man, uh, there's a saying or there's a, a scripture that talks about God, the, the Lord chastens those he loves. That part of his love is the chastening, the correction that comes to his children. Like if he loves you, then he'll discipline you, right? You're not somebody that is a, you call an illegitimate child. Don't get disciplined, right? Think about the dynamic of what many women deal with today, right? Where if I'm coming from a context where I didn't see that all in one human being, where I came up, where somebody actually told me they loved me, they stayed, <laughs> right? They disciplined me, they corrected me, they disciplined me whether it was some level physical based on my age level that was appropriate or it was verbal, I received punishment, yet that same person stayed, loved me, would kiss me the next day, tell me they loved me, right? Um, there would be no switch, it wasn't romantic, it was my father. So over data points, think about that. You, that happens, let's say I'm a reasonable child, I get in trouble every once in a while. Well, I'm getting corrected. He stays. It's not romantic, consistent. Hold on, it's a key point, staying. Yes. Right, and not romantic. It's not romantic, right? And I'm seeing this model. So I'm also seeing a picture of that person. He's loving my, my mom. So in that same person, I get a full picture, a holistic picture of the humanity of a father, but I'm also developing my ability to receive and hear that and not think it's opposite of love. 
So now, think about it. Over the data points from the time that I'm three or four years old that I remember, all the time that I'm like 18, at least that's the pressure cooker because it continues for the rest of your life. I now understand that love is just not, it, love includes correction. Love, remember, because remember, for faith, love is a person. People say God is love. Even they believe in God, people keep saying God is love. He is. Love is a person. And so I can't separate the person from love. So if Father is a representation of God and this person corrected me, loved me, fed me, hugged me, stable, stayed with me, pursued me, protected me, did all of those things in one person, now I am more able, I have the greater capacity to go out into the world with other men, other authority figures, other this, not, like with everyone. And I could receive that, which is often why this is sometimes it's a struggle. We see a lot of the implications, not just in interpersonal relationships, but in marriage. Because then it becomes, it's a, it's a war. You, you correct me, it's like, you don't love me. You hate me. You're attacking me, right? And so versus, I've already received that from my, fa from my father. If you're a woman of faith and you've been in community and you've been discipled, you've also received that from your heavenly father because even the word corrects you or you're under some sort of authority in church where you're getting correction from older women or things. This is why the, uh, the community thing not just affects men, it affects women too. Because if you're in healthy faith community, there's older women, as the as scripture talks about, elder, elder women should teach the younger women. There's older women who are correcting you. But I think the reality is that that is like, like refining what you've received in correction from your father. So now when you get into marriage, and now when it's like, okay, I'm also, he's loving you, he's sacrificial, but there may be times when he has to hold you accountable and correct you. You can't receive that as well if you haven't had almost a lifetime of preparation. That's where the problem runs into play, right? What they call it, being checked. People have never been checked before. And when they do it, they don't take it in the context of, uh, first of all, I think it's a privilege that you have someone that cares enough about you to tell you you're wrong yeah, to exactly. the environment. Right. Because sports, I go back to sports because it's easier. Coaching. If your coach is not saying anything to you, that is an extremely red flag. If your coach is on you, that is a good thing for the most part. Yeah. Unless yeah. it's a weird <laughs> situation. Exactly. Right? Yeah. I mean, as you stated uh, too many times, not just the women, the men, they have never had. And this goes into what we said earlier in regards to kind of how we don't have the elders around in that vibe. If you've never, I, and, I, and, I, and, and in retrospect, I can see how traumatizing it is because if you've never been checked before and all of a sudden a person's telling you about yourself, I can see why people get defensive. Oof, that cold water, bro. Yeah. It's, the cold, it's the cold water bath. It, it'll wake you up really quickly. And you receive that as not love. Here's the difference. Like we talked about, it's the balance of it, right? And so you often see, here's an example that most people would agree with, man. Like, sisters are really good at bigging up other sisters. Right, like the yes, girl, ba 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 ba. Like that's what they do. Affirmation is their love language. Affirmation. Women also struggle in having a hard time to tell difficult truths too. So they notice the, the, the girl is off there doing something, but because they are afraid, if they, because often women often prioritize by their endowment, their gifting, the empathy, and then the emotion. They process their emotion first before the the logic. And so it's just like, how is this going to make her feel? If this is going to make her feel bad, I'm not going to tell her the truth. And also, I don't want the blowback <laughs> that comes from it. So a lot of times they'll sit there. And so that thing, that's a strength. The fire that warms you is the fire that burns you. It also burns you because sometimes you, you're too afraid because you don't want to deal with the blowback. And because you, you, because you know the truth will hurt the feelings, no matter how you say it, you don't want to deal with that. And so you have that dynamic where you don't want to say that. So the benefit is that women are very good at affirming. They'll see it in the empathy. like, yes, you go, because they're speaking to the emotions. And they're great at that, right? That's a gift, but that same gift could hammer you. The same kind with guys are not really often good at that and doing that, right? So I think this is the struggle now where if I'm not hearing affirmation, that's not my love language, right? And so you don't love me. People, I offend people all the time. I tell you, I'm a very truthful person. It's probably cold, you know, and I've gotten better in regards to toning it down, but I just tell you how it is, right? Mm -hmm. And I notice when you don't do that, we have a culture of enablers. And, and that's not with progressive. So if you if I'm doing if you come here and say I'm doing something wrong, you say I'm open to it because I want to improve. Mm. Right? That's just me personally. But like I know it's with a lot of people is that like 
they don't want to hear anything bad about themselves. Not even bad, but they don't want to hear anything they want. They need to improve on. Yeah, the two things I'll say that I think everybody will roll with is they talk about having license to tell the truth, meaning that it's like relationship. People talk about relationship with God. Your relationship is the most important thing first because you don't know if that person cares for you, so you don't know if this truth is to hurt you or if you have my best interest in mind. So there's a different dynamic when your, your sure. friend tells you versus somebody is a stranger. So I do think that's number one. I think number two, which is like, eh, truth is undefeated. Meaning that it may in a season be looking like the truth is, 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 is down on the cards, but the truth is undefeated. There's a beautiful story that um, Sarah Jakes Roberts tells. Sarah Jakes is the daughter of T.D. Jakes. Sarah Jakes talks about, you know, the first time she wrote uh, like a, a chapter or something like that because her father was, was a, is a truth teller and would always tell her like, you're not doing that. Do, 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 do. And I remember she told Chef, she was scared. She sent him like the first chapter of her book. And because he's so hard, he always tells the truth. And he called her and left this long message because he said it was so good. She said that had more impact than anyone, anything anyone else says because she's like, I know that he tells the truth. And so what I'm saying is that at the end of the day, especially if you assume that you're in a relationship and you have a relationship where someone has shown that you've cared for that person, People do this with their parents all the time, where early in their life they didn't get it in the truth, and they're like, they're too hard or this, this, and then they live a little bit of life, and they knew that the person cared, and they come back to it, and be like, you always were. Similarly, I think for many people, that's why the truth is light in a world of darkness. It breaks through. You could see it. You could see the stars from like a whole miles of a sky of darkness. Truth tellers are that, and I think those people typically have the more deep, vulnerable, real relationships. And typically you are seen as a person of wisdom that someone can go to because they're like, the world is going to tell me what I want to hear. Tick, itching ears, they call it. But truth, this is why fathers need to tell the truth. Men need to tell the truth. Women need to tell. We all need to tell the truth because it's so rare. And typically if you're rare, that's where there's value. If there's too much on the market, it's diluted. And so I think it's scary because the truth is going to cost you too. Right. Um, and so I think you have that's why I believe that the truth has to be, you know, you have to believe that it's something transcendent. Like I'm called to say this thing. You think about it, and you do it. So even now, even some of the things we're saying, I say, hey, this may be controversial. But I think for me, the, 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 the pros outweigh because I'm like, you know what? There's probably somebody that wanted to say it or there's one who's been like, I'm unsure, but it seems like whatever they're saying is not right. And somebody says it that now everybody sees they, they seem cool to say it. Right. It's like that person was kind of like, all right, cool. Now they walked out. It seems like this place is safe. I can walk out now. Similarly, I'm just like, we need more truth tellers because most people, I think the truth is an, it's actually a universal. I'll, I'll, like I'll end this piece, I think. No one taught people what's right and wrong. Like at, there's at some point, you know, like people grow up, people see kids say that's mine. Like I think we have a disposition towards darkness without God. And I think to some degree, there's also a disposition about what the truth is. Whether people admit it or not, there's things I, I can see sometimes when I see somebody in an interview, they're saying something that I know they don't believe, right? But they know they're saying it because they need to say it, because it's safe to say it, or economically, if they don't say it, the politicians do this all. So I think, but the reality is that there's something in all of us. I think the truth is actually imprinted in all of us. That's why we forgot. It's like it's in, we're the image of God. We know, we have a sense of the truth, even if no one said it, about what's right and what's wrong. We know whether something, that seems all. I don't Oh, something seems off about that. I think that's, we all know what the truth is. And I think those people who tell the truth free people up to live accordingly. Uh, like the one thing I'll say, I was saying this to my, to, to a significant other yesterday, and, and we we're talking about like she was speaking to somebody who was really make, not making the best decisions in their life. And I said, if somebody was like crossing the street and a car was coming, and you pushed them out the way, and they scraped up their arm, but you prevented them from getting killed. You know, would you think that's worth it? She's like, yeah. I'm like, but what if you say nothing because you don't want to say something in the, the, the opportunity of them? Like, it actually is hateful if you see somebody walk right across the street on incoming traffic and you say nothing, a car is coming. That's, that's it's almost evil. 
It's like having the cure to, uh, to AIDS or disease and keeping it to yourself because you're afraid about how they're going to receive it. That's the truth. I, I, I tend to, the more that I sit with the truth that way in relationship, the more I say, you actually have an obligation. And I pray that people who sense what the truth is, the world needs more truth tellers. It's going to cost you, but trust me, if you are a person of faith, you will be rewarded for it. Maybe not now, but ultimately you will.